pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, revisions to the agenda? No? Uh, summary of non-public actions from January 22nd, 2014. Mr. Miller made a motion to approve the non-public minutes of January 8th, 2014 as written. Mr. York seconded. Motion carried 4-0-0. Any presentations or recognitions? I was going to mention that <coughs> Agnon was named to the United States Senate program, but I'll wait till she comes in so at least she can enjoy that. Uh, correspondence? <coughs> we have a couple? Yeah, there were several emails <coughs> from Common Core. Did you leave this point? Yes. Okay, I'll forward those on to Michelle for the minutes. Yes, yes, we had my wife. Four emails <gasps> from Mr. Common Core. State Sanders. Any other correspondence? Approval of draft minutes from 122. <coughs> I'll make Good. a motion to approve them as printed. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Trish, I think you want to abstain. Stay. Is it the um 20 second? You're not here this morning, sorry? Okay. No, she doesn't. I thought you were yeah. looking at the um, deliberative. No. <coughs> Abstain? Abstain, yes. I'm sorry, Derek. Motion carries 301. That's fine. Uh, super dense comments. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped. <coughs> Community forum. You should start late every week. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Superintendent's uh. comments deal with a, a couple of issues. The first is that uh, we received information a short while ago that uh, Campbell High School was no longer on the list as a priority school. Um, the board decision to not accept Title I funds for the school. Uh, meant that the federal government agreed with the Department of Ed and it's strangely enough the argument that we had made to in our appeal uh, after being turned down by the state board uh, apparently the argument resonated that if we're actually not a title one school it's hard to be named a title one priority school um, therefore Shortly after that, NECAP results came out, and uh, it would have been, have been interesting had we not received the news the Friday before, because we were told by the commissioner that if Campbell had shown significant growth this year with NECAP, that um, they could have come off the list. And in fact, the re and that was based on reading and math, and the reading results were up, I believe, two percent, and the math results were up thirteen percent from thirty-three percent proficient to forty-six percent proficient. 46% proficient is still not where we would like to be, but that is still 10% higher than the state average and uh, a relatively uh, significant piece. It should be noted that the, the group of students who were in grade 11 this year had scored above the state average in math uh, from grade three all the way through grade end of grade eight. In the last three years, they had scored, I believe it was seven points above so clearly what happens at K through 8 is important for what happens at the high school. Um, you know, the improvement in math at the, at the elementary and middle school level uh, paved the, the uh, way for uh, future success in high school. And, and in fact, that makes three of the last four years that the high school has scored above the, the state average. Um, somewhat disconcerting has been the last two years of grade three results uh, in both reading and math. Uh, significantly below. This year's grade four showed a significant bounce back from or improvement from grade three to grade four. We hope that trend continues, but it is something that uh, uh, the school is looking at. And uh, I know that the school and 
correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, but there have significant sites set aside on March 11th to take a look at NECAP data and break down and see where the, they had, the students had strengths and weaknesses across all grade levels in both reading and math. Um, this will be the last administration of NECAP reading, math, and writing. Science will continue. That's the only measure of science, and it will believe, I believe it will it'll continue to be a May administration. Um, other than that, we're, we're seeing some grade level patterns that, that I think will cause some people to go back, some grade levels to go back and look at, at what we're doing um, at that particular grade level. Um, there was grade three math and grade six reading results had shown that the rough cohort of students passing through had uh, decreased in each of the last three years. So I know that Mr. Lechleiter has already addressed that with the group and looking at actually sources of text and whether or not it's at an appropriately high level for grade six. And uh, Mr. Thompson has already started working with folks on the, the grade three math to see where they are. Um, in theory, when we move to Smarter Balance in the spring of 2015, the Department of Ed indicates that you will be able to do some comparisons back towards NECAP results. Um, they have some very talented people working there and uh, some very good psychometricians at the Center for Assessment. Um, but I'll need to be convinced that that will be true. In some ways, we'll be starting anew with a different test or with higher standards. So uh, thank you. Job well done, by and large. Uh, some good news, especially at the high school level. Uh, some good news as well at upper grades in elementary and in a couple of grades in middle school. Um, you know, not where we would like to be at, at, at any of the schools, given the, the demographics of the, the, uh, the population. Um, but uh, especially at the higher school, at the, the high school, the trend is certainly in the right direction. Thank you. <coughs> Any questions on the NECAP results? Great school board comments? <coughs> no. Moving on to curriculum report. Um, I think uh, Bronay had spoke um, I think before we do the actual approval of those texts, did we want to actually do the, mm -hmm. the comparison of the evaluation tool? Uh, just to make sure we all agree on it before we use it for the approving those final texts. So do you want to just skip down to, I guess the easiest way to look at is, is that tool to policy, the tenth document there. I found that a pretty good um, method of comparing the, the, um, the actual evaluation tool back to the policy myself. Could I speak to it? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. I, the committee and I thought that that would be a good way to do it, both the, um, the one that's the tool that has the notations, but then if you wanted to also look at the policy, the one, the file that starts with the word policy, that also has notations. So when you go through it, um, you can see the, the, and that's why I lettered the questions or the items on the tool, um, so that you could make that comparison. Um, the major change that we made was to page three. We felt that these items were um, really sort of broad, overarching items. Um, some of them, uh, more, not necessarily related to individual resources, but more to programs and that kind of thing. So we added um, item P to the tool. Policy requirements attached have been considered and met as appropriate. Um, and the, they would have to then, hopefully, that's why we put the check boxes, just sort of a. I don't see P. Oh. On page P in the tool itself? Yes. I see P as, is there a comparable resource that already exists? I look at the wrong one. Um, <coughs> yeah. Number nine. Refresh your screen. Oh, okay. You should be, yeah, and I have to apologize to you and to Michelle because I'm, uh, in my haste to get this done, um, oh, okay. I made some errors and was actually revising it early today. 
The one you should be looking at um, should at the bottom say um, approved revision 12 2013 and it goes through S on page 2. Yep. Okay. So um, item P is referring to page 3 policy requirements and we listed from um, IJL section B under objectives seven items from policy the revision under procedures Roman numeral 2 instructional materials those four items and then also from the revision um, section 3 criteria those five items and then if obviously by saying no we would ask for an explanation but hopefully it would draw people's attention to that but mostly the committee you know park committee as um, Trish can attest is really very diligent we take we meet for an hour and a half once a month and we take a lot of time with each of these resources going over each of the elements that doesn't mean we're all infallible but usually with seven mem seven people present we um, usually do that in a lot of detail the other item is L um, having discovered in the policy the mention of author we added to L reputation of author and publisher so it would have to meet both of those criteria in order to um, pass muster so to speak okay. the other thing that we're suggesting um, and they and they would require policy changes if you chose to do it if you look at page three of the tool um, a couple of them are just grammatical so you may not want to do that but starting at the top um, number two their daily lives number three materials that stimulate so th those are sort of generic things but down at the very the, the last section under criteria number three attention should be given to um, the committee really felt we should change the word sex to gender that appeared to be the intent and that's what was in the tool um, prior that was adopted um, in 2010 now the items that you can see that are um, not referenced back to the policy in the tool are J the committee felt that we should keep that item that durability should be considered um, again whether these are changed in the policy or not it's certainly your discretion I think you could argue that durability goes to price as well okay I mean, that, that, yeah. in my opinion I don't know so I mean if it's not durable it factors into the, the cost of the long-term cost right and that's why in R we put immediate and long-term cost and O quality and quantity of ancillary materials we felt was really important any comments do you think I, I just I don't understand why we have criteria in the procedures that don't match that it's not one for one I, I guess the way I look at it is the, the criteria in the policy is kind of overarching like overall purpose that's the criteria to be overall purpose is the criteria but in the actual tool when you're evaluating it you have to break down overall purpose into you know is it applicable to the grade level is it um, you know what what's the lesson you're trying to approach I'm guessing I mean I'm not an educator but I guess it, it, is the problem then the criteria is just too generic maybe as I said a couple of months ago I really don't care which way it goes but yeah. what the procedure calls out should be what the form uses and if we like what the form says then that's what we need to make the policy say otherwise we have spent hours on policies that we're just not following because the verbiage has changed just a little bit and you're gonna have somebody else come in and argue well it's close to that and you did it over here and the proverbial slippery slope is what we end up falling down I guess then I didn't understand what the charge was this form was approved back in 2010 and the, uh, I'm indicating the only changes that Herc is recommending was approved by the board yes the forms that you've been receiving prior to December all 
were approved back in 2010. Okay. When we came with the, a couple <coughs> of ch the changes that are now Q, R, and S, um, those were the additions that we requested to be made to the 2010 version. This says 1 2014 approved revision. Refresh your screen. I did, I thought. That was my error. The, uh, I was thinking it was our January meeting. I went back and checked the minutes. It was December. But the changes were made from the 2010 version. I, th I think the document serves the purpose described by the procedure, but I agree with Dennis that you've got a series of documents with a smorgasbord of things that aren't laid out well, and you're mapping to it. It would be preferable if we aligned the policies and streamlined them so that you could literally map one for one and know that it's... Yeah, and we always run into problems when we take policy and put it into something else because the policy gets updated and there's no, not necessarily a linkage that's obvious to everyone that's looking at it that we then need to go change this. That's why we always wanted to have the policy and then the procedures and any forms like there is for the school use and all of those things are bundled. It's until somebody questions a decision. Correct. In which case. I mean, all a parent has to do is object to something and say you didn't follow your own policy. And we can talk about how we did follow, tried to follow our policy, but. Could we just, I guess I'll get the policy as your overarching goals, your kind of the direction you're giving the, the, the committee, where the tool is kind of the, the nitty gritty. You're not going to, I guess, outline every single tiny little piece that you're going to consider well, in the policy. Or we, I, I or we agree with the policy, the but there's a set of procedures that's below the, the policy is only one page. Yeah. The procedures are where the criteria is called out. So yeah, I, I, I should be more specific that the procedures that are in the policy manual don't match the procedure or the forms that we're using to do the evaluation. We're going to say the lack of mapping will never be an issue up until the day that they become an issue. And then it'll be a real issue. Because none of us will be sitting here. Uh, I was, I'm on the committee, um, and I, I can remember this conversation as we had it. And what we felt was that the form that's used is given to the teachers to decide and how to get to a point where they want to make a recommendation. So that's what that form is. After that, then the committee then is charged with the procedures to ensure that board policy is followed through on. So that tool is being used by teachers who then submit it to the PERC committee who then validates it against the, the procedures and the policy so that when they come to you with a recommendation, they have something that, that, is, that is aligned already. So y y there's kind of a step not, you know, there's an intermediate step there at the PERC committee beyond what you see on that form. But you've got to have... I just think Dennis's point is that if, if, the, if the form works for the teachers and for the PERC committee and then it comes to the board, then the policy should mirror the form. That's all, That's all I'm trying to say is they should, because M, which is scientifically researched, isn't in the set of procedures. No, so uh, agreed. Agreed, but we... Why are we going to... I mean, Jason used to sit here and argue... Why are we going to write these if we ain't going to follow them? Exactly. And I, I, we, that was the exact conversation we were having on the PERC committee. I said, I remember very well when this policy was written because I was sitting at the table. And so, and, and again, I played, I played uh, devil's advocate you as we were discussing this because I remember the conversation you were having specifically like you are tonight. And I, I personally don't see the problem with giving the teachers a tool to get people into the ballpark, is how we described it, and then once in the ballpark, the PERC committee then aligns it and makes sure and sends it back for more questions or, or, you know, whatever clarification it needs to ensure that each step is already made. Julie was going to make a checklist then that you could take the teacher's information <coughs> and then just check, do, you know, do a checklist and say, yep, 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 meets this, meets that, meets this, meets that. So then PERC could come here and make a, a recommendation at that point and ensure it, it meets policy. I, I think, I, I think, um, I think Julie has done a great job on that, and quite honestly, I, I, I think, you know, I, if you remember well, I was one of the ones that main concern with this whole policy, right? And so, I'm very happy with it. I think I think this absolutely meets. <coughs> it'd be very difficult for the teachers and time consuming to take and try to hit every one of those things. We need we need them to provide us with the resources, what their recommendations are, and then the PERC committee would then take the time to make sure that it follows the policy. 
I, I think that works really well. Uh, I wouldn't object if this is an internal thing that teachers use to provide the perk, but it shouldn't show up as to the board as the manifestation of the procedure because maybe, we maybe already so. have a procedure. Yeah, so, so either make the procedure align with, if this is the set of criteria that's everybody believes is the best set of criteria, then that's what our IJL procedures should have as under the criteria that we're gonna ask these specific questions. And then there's no need to reference the policy in there. And if you wanna update that form, it's already a piece of procedures. And Michelle would be the first one to then come and say, if you change that form, you have to bring that, we have to get that approval back through for whatever that change might be. And that might be the procedures that you, the teachers do the form, you know, that's, and, and bring it to the perk committee and, and off you go. Yeah, it's, it's just showing up. And if anybody that tracked this, it would be, that would be what is being presented to the board as the procedure, mm -hmm. which isn't the procedure. in the exact words of the policy is that what you're saying because you can see from the <coughs> mapping you said m isn't there scientifically research but if you look at the policy the revision under procedures criteria section roman numeral three uh, that's one way to define our authoritativeness i mean i have to tell you and i'll only give you my opinion a lot of the language in this policy is really hard to put into practice and interpret when you're looking at the resource and you're saying, you know, I, I even looked up the definition of that when I was cross-checking because I'm thinking to myself, what do they really mean? I can say somebody's an authority and somebody else might not agree. So I had to make assumptions that when this original tool was written and adopted in 2010 that that probably was, you know, the one of the definitions that you could have for authoritativeness, which would be that it's a scientifically based um, program or material, which I is one of the things we'd look I at. I agree. It's, and I mean, the problem there is the criteria, it's so kind of open-ended that. It is. What's overall anything? purpose? I mean, it, 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 that's like saying make it neat. What does that mean? So maybe it's colored and Do we change straight. the criteria? Just get rid of those one to ten and take these A to P's and drop them in? I mean, is that? I think that's, if the form is the vehicle, the procedure that we're using, or the, or the manifestation of the procedure, then that should become the criteria section, is that form. Or when it says criteria, it says see attached form, which is at the end of the procedures. We do that for like school use, um, there's a whole bunch of things. Searches and uh, student searches, the form that has to be filled out is there. Well, and, and that the way it's very this, clear. There's a medium re media review form that yeah. is at the end of this. Yeah. yeah, that's the way that I would suggest that you approach it. And then there's no ambiguity. When somebody says, why did you pick this? You say, here's the reasons. And they'll say, well, do you match what you said you were going to do? And you say, yes, we do. It's not a, well, we believe it fits in this category because... Because anytime there's wiggle room, somebody's going to wiggle, and wiggles end up costing money in and one, one way or another. And what should we do with the, the, the broader Objective. items, like the ones I put on page three, because they are broad? They're, yeah. I mean, it's not. Well, I'm saying you can't if you look at the book and, and say overall purpose. If you, you know? put the form in, I don't think you need to reference the policy requirements at all. And if we need to tighten up the language above the criteria selection, that's one of the things that we should do then. Are you saying for her to insert this form? Under criteria? Is that well, or in the criteria, say, see attached, uh, whatever the title is. Uh, Curriculum Resource Evaluation Tool. That's easy enough. I mean, I, I, I see what you're saying, Dennis. I mean, th there's always going to be, I mean, these are kind of opinions. They're not scientifically yeah. answered questions. They're it's, subjective. It, yeah. So, you know, in the end, it's still going to be. But in the end, if this is a document that's not, a, if the document isn't board approved, If, it is, if it's in a different set of alignment, then that's where you get in issues. 
So do we, I just need to know what our charge is for clarification. So let's start at the beginning of IJL. So we would leave responsibility. Objectives is where some of those things actually could be criteria. That's yeah. why I've put the letters because there was alignment. Um, and then when you go to IJL R procedures under Roman numeral two structural materials, those are aligned and yet they almost are criteria. I, you know, not knowing the history, it's hard for me to know how come some were in one place versus another, but factual content is a criteria. I mean, all of three, four of those. So are we looking to revise only R? I personally think R is fine. Or no, L is fine. Yeah, so R. Personally, I'm fine with the way it is. I think, I think the policy kind of sets the objectives and the criteria, and the tool is just a tool to kind of quantify. And don't bring the tool to the board, because the tool is the implementation of that's well, the, the procedures that what are being used. What else would we that's bring to the board? Yeah, that's how they communicate. You would have to define within though. that criteria, which I, without mapping, you could say that's all I'm saying is yeah. there's a subjectivity here that. Or, or make this the procedure. If this, is, if this is the tool, that's easier for that's us. That's what if I was this saying. Is the tool that, that you believe is the most appropriate tool and that Perk believes is working, then let's revise use it. the, the, the yeah. uh, procedures to just say, here's the tool we use. Here's the question. Yeah, because I, I think that the board needs to see how this sheet was filled out because you need to know well, where, you're making where, a did, decision. where they, were they seeing weaknesses and yeah. where I were they seeing I think this is the report strengths. to the board. Yeah. Here's that's the criteria and objectives. This is the report, you know. I don't, know, I don't know if the report has to map one to one to the. Could we revise Roman numeral two and three and align those with the form? Because really those are, they fit yeah. together. Yeah, you could, you could right. blend them into one and say, see the attached, you know, come up. I guess it would be form IJL or whatever Michelle says the name should be. Um, and then that's part of that of the procedures like we do for other things and then it's not ambiguous at all okay. this is what we say we're going to do and that's what we're going to do yeah the the one that's called request for reconsideration of material is called IJL-1 so, so we be a two right or a whatever the right number is. well the other one should be one and this should be two but whatever your desire is at that time Do you want them to come back with a draft of the revised IJLR or? Well, I, I think it's simple enough if they're just going to change out those two sections with the form, you can just bring it back and we can approve it. And I think everybody seems to agree that the form works. Yeah, well, I'm not arguing with the form. I just want to make sure <coughs> if we have an episode like we had several years ago that we're on very firm footing as this is the selection criteria that we, we used and the evaluation that um, was done for that, which we didn't necessarily have before. I can't make a decision. I, I'm just. Yeah, I'm yeah, no, I guess if you guys bring back <coughs> um, two and three swapped out with basically some text and <coughs> a reference to this, then I would think we could prove it. That's fine by me. Seems like there's a pretty good consensus. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's fine. Okay, I think I didn't understand the last time apparently, <laughs> so I'm hoping I understand. Makes sense to me. And if we're replacing these, I was thinking I had to reorder these also, but only because of the order that was in here. Like but if we're replacing <coughs> them, the order shouldn't matter. It doesn't matter to me. I think whatever's probably most, most helpful to you guys. Okay. So given that we are adopting the tool, can we go ahead and approve the materials or uh, any objections to that or no. okay. so you want to start with Horton's miraculous mechanisms <coughs> yeah I don't think I have anything to say beyond what's on there um, the 
fourth grade is continuing to look for a little bit longer text. They already had a selection list of shorter text from their anthology, so we're trying to supplement that with, um, with longer text. So these two pieces would be helpful. Well, Horton. Hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a criteria, though. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve uh, Horton's Miraculous Mechanisms. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries 4 0 0. Helen's eyes. Um, the white giraffe, the giraffe. sorry, oh, under sorry, grade call. four. And this is at, a, at the oh, high yeah. end of the Lexile range for grade four. And so um, that's prefer uh, preferred at the end of grade, toward the end of grade four. And um, the teachers indicated that uh, several possibilities for critical thinking, which again are all part of um, our new standards. Now, is this something that they've had? They've had a few copies for individual students to read. Okay, because this looks well loved. Yes. Um, yeah, I think there's a notation on the form that many students have read the book in the okay. past and really enjoyed it. Okay. The other book, apparently, they don't have any classroom copies. That's their library copy. Okay. It does look on the higher side good. And these all fit within the amount of um, this year's budget. This one's fiction. I'm assuming. Yes. Um, we'll get the check. What's well, an accurate content was not applicable, so I assume that meant it was fiction. Yes. Do you have a motion? I make a motion to approve the weight giraffe. I'll second that. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 4 zero, 0 Now we have Helen's eyes for grade 7. And I should give you a little history of this. This was for first brought to the committee earlier in the year, and um, we didn't happen to have a copy of it. So we acquired some copies to be able to take a look at it and um, felt that it, it was described initially as um, a photobiography, which it says on the cover, but there are many pages of full text. And, um, yep, yeah, absolutely. Can I see one too? Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen something rated this high before. All fives, a couple fours. Well, one of the major considerations, and these, uh, this is a criteria in the policy, which is that it provides some coherence with the rest of the curriculum, and because we've already approved that the students can uh, would be reading um, the Diary of Anne Frank in seventh grade, then this is a very reasonable companion to that. It gives background, obviously, to her teacher um, um, in biographical form makes it engaging for the students. That's another important criteria because of the photographs and so forth. Do you have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve Helen's eyes. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Stay. Motion carries 4 zero, zero. <coughs> Um, advanced Placement Calculus BC, um, there was discussion um, at this board previously about that course, and uh, it ran for uh, three students this year. 
more on a tutorial basis with the instructor. So here we are saying that um, we'd like it to be officially in the program of studies and um, the syllabus that you see uh, was submitted to the College Board Advanced Placement Division um, and it was accepted through their audit process. So now it's an official course. Um, will it still be run as a extended learning opportunity or will it be an actual class? Or? Similar to the rest of the courses in the regular program, uh, we would require a certain enrollment for the course to run it as a, a standalone course. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we have the other vehicles, which would include ELO and um, other options. Yep. So if they did run it as, a, so, so say only three kids signed up, you couldn't run it as a full class, and they ran it the same way they did this year, would there, how would it be graded for the GPA? So we don't run it as the same issue we did? Because we put year. it in the program of studies, and we could count it as a right. class, and okay. we count it in the GPA. So it would be an honors course, is it honors, or, okay. No, honors well, and then AP, right? So it would be right, an AP right, course. Right. Actually, yeah. Yeah. An extra point, right? Yeah, extra A little point. bit of commentary? Yeah. I, I think Campbell does a very nice job both guidance and administration and teachers of trying to find ways to offer a full range of courses given a, give a limited number of staff. Uh, creative with with both extended work like this and also creative with remedial work uh, or supplementary work. Or if a student comes in last year we offered uh, individual sport uh, of just small numbers of students who needed the half credit in economics. Um, so rather than have them taken a, a two credit course, we actually, you know, found some funds. We do need to formalize our processes for that. Um, and uh, the administration and, and I have been working on a, a sort of a draft proposal that has been sitting uh, for a year about the funding of VLOs. So we'll, we'll, you know, uh, we'll talk about that and bring that to the board at some point in time. Um, but in a situation like this, it's not likely that you're going to be able to offer this as a course every year. I mean, it'd be great if we had eight kids, but that means that at least eight kids will have to take AP Calculus as a junior. Until we do something more with math acceleration, that's not going to happen very much. Uh, what, we're, what we're planning for next year with the grade seven math will help, but I think the next thing we have to look up at after that, and, and is it, Math acceleration, math and, I think what we'll look at at the middle school after the grade seven math is math enrichment, but there is a place for a small number of students for math acceleration, uh, which would allow uh, potentially a student to achieve geometry one in middle <coughs> school at the end of eighth grade, which would put them on a track to, to you know, for somebody who is trying to get into MIT, somebody who's trying to get into Caltech, somebody who's trying to get into those sorts of schools, you can, you can do what Zach did Zach Wagner last year, and that is he went to UNH Manchester for his Calc 2. Um, more and more, we're trying to, to offer those sorts of courses here and do it on, a, on a, a, uh, a relatively inexpensive basis, and, and so that's what we're looking for. By putting this in the program of studies, it solves the issue of whether or not this counts as an AP weighted course in the GPA and it gives students advance notice that it will. Because of the way Ms. Angelini approaches teaching and learning in her classroom, these students sit in with the AP Calculus students. There's a lot of independent work in her class. There's a lot of small group work. Her teaching style and the, the, the learning style of advanced math learners sync very well which allow her to provide this opportunity for these students. So in most years, this is probably the way that it would be, some sort of stipend for the additional work, the additional prep, the additional grading, all that other stuff. Um, because it is a, a separate curriculum and a separate prep. Uh, over time, it would be really great if we could either offer that on a regular basis or AP stats one or the other. So just one question I had on the syllabus. It says retakes for specific summatives or at the discretion of the instructor? Doesn't that go against what's in the handbook? Which says... Doesn't it go against? What's in the handbook about retakes is that you get one retake per summative per rating period or I don't know if it's semester or quarter or whatever. I just think we, sh we should be in alignment. 
otherwise <coughs> there's subjectivity there that I don't know that we want to have. Bottom of page one, top of page two, is that what you're looking at? Yes. If you prefer each other. Technically, the syllabi are not part of the curriculum. It's a, it's a definitely an observation. <laughs> if you hand that to somebody, no, no, no. somebody will walk that. in with it. Yes, and this, it, I mean, that could be said perhaps of some other courses. It's worth, you know, noticing that alignment should occur. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where did you see that? It's in the syllabus <coughs> at the bottom of page one. Oh, page one. Okay. Oh, I see it. Where if, if you look it up in the CHS um, student handbook, it says that summative assessments, you can retake one per competency per grading period, I think, or per semester. I don't remember which one it is. Otherwise, you have students that get a 90 and want to retake it because they want to get a 96 or a hundred or whatever and mm -hmm. if you don't leave any wiggle room then so do we need to approve this or do you approve it? Probably you need to approve the course description okay. and it's the, just the it's just in the, the handbook. course description and the actual curriculum will appear in the 9 the through trial. 12 curriculum that's yet to come to you. But I put it here for informational purposes <coughs> and asked for it yeah. so that we could know what is behind the description. The 9 through 12 is the one that differed from Correct. the 3 through 8. Okay. But there were also a few missing pieces. And this will also be in the, the program of studies too. The description will be in the program of studies. We have a motion to approve the course description. Make a motion to approve the description. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Stay. Motion carries four zero zero. Sorry, who said that? Right. Okay. Pre-algebra daily um, is based upon a course that we previously offered, pre-algebra, on a uh, one credit at every other day basis. I would make one edit at this time that apparently we didn't pick up at the time. This should be one credit mathematics and one elective credit similar to what we do with AP calculus AB because it is every day uh, but you don't want to give two math credits because students have to take algebra ones required and you would want them to take at least one other math um, uh, again you will see the detailed uh, curriculum in that um, 9 through 12 document but this course, and we didn't put it in the description because it raises a lot of questions, but implied in that language is that there will be a high degree of differentiation because of the very nature of the course means that students have not been successful with the previous curriculum because they're not prepared yet for Algebra 1. And so you can have students that have a wide range of skills at this point. Um, and what we found this year with the Algebra 1 Daily <coughs> is that we have a lot of students who are very successful, but the students who were, um, I'll refer to it as being further behind in terms of their mastery of skills, um, continued to struggle. There was not enough time in the course to really rebuild those foundational skills. We are hoping that in the not too distant future, we will not need this course, um, or at least not as many students over time, um, given the strengthening their skills at the lower grades with the revised curriculum and instructional skills that we've focused on. So what's the math track for someone that would take this as a freshman? They have to go to, the, everyone has to take Algebra 1. 
So most of these students, if I were to predict, I would say they would then go into Algebra 1 daily okay. because of the pacing issue, and, and then they would take geometry. So they, it's very important um, <clears throat> that, and I have to tell you, all of a sudden my mind went blank. Did we ever decide whether geometry was going to be required for a graduation requirement? Okay. I know we brought it to the board. I think we approved you have it in the program I, I, that I way? Think, I think that we... It's, just, it's, it's been approved that way in we the... We did approve that. I remember I was here. Well, but... <clears throat> yes, but not yet. I mean, <clears throat> we brought it to the board last year. I think we and in that vein, I will just say that it's very important that students have geometry. Students who are going into industrial arts or any kind of uh, manufacturing all should have should have some that at least basic high school geometry. So uh, if we gave two math credits for this, they could just have those two in algebra and not take geometry. And it really, given that we're, by policy, our credits are competency-based, given it's the same number of, given it's the same level of competency and just a le different length of time to achieve that competency, you could argue only one credit. But given that these are our most struggling students, if we give that second credit, it means that they can use it as an elective and they won't fall behind in their in their course requirements. So and that's it, what we do it encourages geometry. students to, to take the course that will best benefit their academic development. And, and this year, for the first year, we'll be doing an assessment of eighth graders coming in so we will have an idea where we believe that they belong so we'll have a better idea of placement so last year when we finished the math presentation and we said you know we students are can take pre-calculus or they can take uh, or sorry uh, pre-algebra or they can take uh, algebra one daily and then we got to the scheduling process we looked at it and said okay we've got <coughs> two classes Will the pre-algebra students be better off taking pre-algebra 90 minutes every second day, or would they be better off in algebra one daily in which they get twice as much math? And the answer is probably better off in, in algebra one daily. But the achievement gap is large enough for some students that they need a one. double block of pre-algebra before they take algebra daily. So we didn't have that option and there is enough differentiation there that, that I think the best way to go is algebra, or sorry, uh, daily uh, pre-algebra and then daily algebra. But if we do that and do it well and hold to the standard that we should hold students to, the need for geometry daily should go away. Mm -hmm. Is inclusion of this course going to drive any six periods in math? Um, right now, it would have be the same number. We have two Algebra 1 dailies this year, and the problem is you've got that spread of kids across two sections. And so what we anticipate next year is we'll have one section of pre-algebra daily, one section of Algebra 1 daily. So there'll be no change from this year. So for a student to get into this class, is this something that a teacher needs to recommend for them to go into? I, or is this, you know, I just don't want a student saying, oh, this is an easy class. So that's why we're going to do the, t the assessment. So right now, the eighth grade teachers make recommendations and okay. parents make recommendations. Um, but we'll also have that assessment and we'll also use the data from like previous kneecaps mm -hmm. is what we use for geometry. We actually <coughs> went back and looked at you know, what were the 20 students that we knew were going to need everyday geometry? And the only reason, remember, when we came to the board to talk about geometry is we picked geometry because we were just trying to stop the, the, you know, avulsion, you know, but now we seem to start filling those gaps. Okay. And so at what point do we reevaluate whether we still need this or not? Good point. I, this year, we will we would be offering three sections of daily. Would be my expectation: one of pre-algebra daily, one of uh, algebra one daily, 
and one of Geometry Daily. And I think a year from now we need to sit down and see and determine whether or not we actually need that Geometry Daily. And was it successful in what your purpose was, your goal was? This year's juniors, mm -hmm. a lot of the students who took the kneecap, and remember we got significant gains in kneecap compared to the state with, with this year. This is the first group that had Geometry Daily. And anecdotally, uh, based on the information from the instructor and, and from conversation with students, uh, they felt that there was evidence that it, this clearly was benefiting students, um, as it should. Um, and this is somewhat of, of an external evaluation of, of that summary. But one of the things that, that Dr. E and I have talked about is, is the need to become a lot more formal in our evaluation of curriculum after it's done. Uh, so it's, it's a point very well taken. Well, I think I'd like to see something like this because we do want to phase that out and become less handicap on this, is to evaluate it each year. That way there it doesn't slide and you realize five years down the road, kids are just kind of, you know, slipping into this class and getting, you know, easy credits. Well, just to reassure you that a course doesn't run if we don't need it just because it's in the program and, an, and approved. So with the vetting process that's listed there, which is eighth grade recommendations in the committee, and the committee can use whatever data, and um, Lori's already described the kind of data that would be brought to that committee. Uh, if it's a smaller number or not enough to run the class or none, hopefully eventually none, then the course wouldn't run. The bar for any of those courses in the daily course and the one credit course should be identical. In the end, students should be functioning at the same level and have the same grades. So a B in one should be equivalent to a B in the other. Some kids just need more remediation <coughs> because they have bigger gaps to fill to get to that point. I mean, one of the things that we know is that if, if <coughs> you maintain absolute consistency of time, you're going to end up with variability of learning, which is what happens all the way through K to eight. And so you get come some students who are way ahead, and others who got 80% of it in grade three which means they get less than 80% of it in grade four <coughs> and less than that in grade five. And so the only way to maintain consistency of what students know is to vary the time. And the industrial model of schools that we have doesn't do that very well, which is why, you know, the middle school is trying to do RTI and is why we do, you know, uh, uh, extra help after school and that sort of thing. So that, that, that time function is what should change. But the standards, if we do this right, will be the same. Do you have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve pre-algebra daily description. Do you have a second? Second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Stay. Motion carries 4-0-0. Okay, and the last um, item, literature and film. I'll give you a little history that um, last year this course appeared in the program as storytelling and film. Um, we didn't have a record that it was vetted individually as a course. Um, and secondly, um, the guidance office was informed that the course did not meet NCAA eligibility for English. Now I should say that we have other courses that don't meet NCAA um, requirements for core courses um, and that is because they uh, really don't care what your electives are for the most part. Um, there is a GPA consideration but in general they're looking at your core courses and um, for they require four credits of English as we do for graduation and so um, within those four core core courses, um, th what they're saying is this couldn't be used. And just to review, um, although we have mandatory courses for all of our students in their freshman year, sophomore and junior years, um, during the senior year, and a course we call senior English is required, either a full year honors course, and therefore a student would have the four credits or with AP English, or they can opt for the one semester uh, half credit senior English and then they would need to take an acceptable elective to round out their four credit courses. Um, so in 
its storytelling and film form, students couldn't use that course for uh, potential NCAA eligibility. Um, and my understanding from my previous experience is that um, there were two aspects. One, the storytelling aspect w was not as tight in terms of the literary um, uh, value of it, the literary rigor, and a course in film, although commendable in and of itself, would not meet the English requirement. So upon doing some research, we found that there were some very strong courses that um, tied the literature and film together and uh, that previously that could be eligible not only for NCAA uh, credit, but would probably meet our standards as we've discussed rigor in the past. So as you see, the course here was presented to PERC. Um, and the committee was very favorable. The only change that um, we suggested, we approved, was the focus on literature. And of course, literature, unless it um, is by its very nature a story, um, we're, ta we're not talking about informational uh, nonfiction text here. Um, but it's clear that um, although storytelling is a component of it, it's the literature in and of itself and the writing that would occur. Again, if we approve this in concept in the description, then in, um, we would expect that the curriculum be developed prior to the course being uh, actually run, <coughs> which would be this spring. And I've been in touch with the curriculum facilitator, and um, she is interested in doing that. So this would be something that you'd be reviewing uh, the film and the literature this spring, you're saying? Okay. That's so it would be in place by fall? That's what the request was, to, to actually see the curriculum. That's, we would have it in the program of studies so that students could register, but prior to scheduling the course and having it run, we would have the curriculum uh, in place. Am I um, portraying that accurately? Some of, from a from a procedural perspective, when the board approves something, you could approve a program description, which is pretty much what that paragraph is. Mm -hmm. You could approve a syllabus, which is usually a two-page, a little bit more detailed version, or you could approve the actual curriculum. Um, we Last year, the board, for example, approved that grade eight literature with technology course, gave you information on what the standards would look like, what the instruction would look like, but it didn't have a formal document. Uh, on the next board meeting, uh, we're going to have the teacher of that course uh, come back and present on that course. And it's our expectation that at the end of, of, of year one, we're going to come with a fuller description for full board approval of that. So the timelines are relatively short. We're also working on the, the, the math program as well. So depending on the, the, the amount of depth, I don't think the practice of the board should be to give final approval simply based on a course description, but that before the course is actually offered and to create sections of it, it should, the board should be approving either the syllabus or the actual curriculum. Um, in some cases it could be, we understand, we think this is a good thing, you have a year, but this course has actually been offered for a significant amount of time, I believe. So. So one question I have is, historically there have been comments made that senior English has a lot of films within it. How is this different from that? Um, we can either look now or we can look when we do the program of studies. Um, that <coughs> course description was revised for this year. Um, and it, it initially the course um, how shall I describe it, was all in one. It was, we only offered the full credit course and um, integrated in the whole course was an abundance of films. Those are my words. Um, but looking at the syllabus, it was pretty clear that there were a large number of films. And so, um, Lord So this is in, in response to that, right. to get to, to... They really liked the movie, so we created a course. No, no, no. no. <laughs> To, in response to that, to create, uh, you know, a course that the teachers um, 
when they designed the <coughs> curriculum um, in 2000, they wanted it to be a well-rounded curriculum. What we wanted to do is have a little more control over that piece. And so that's why we're redesigning. And that's why we separated the senior English class and, and pulled it out. And that's why we're doing all this work. So, so it, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. So the films in the literature have prior approval already by the PERC? They've been doing it. They've been doing, yeah. This, it, well, I don't think PERC was here in 2000. At, at that time. I think PERC oh, is new. That's way back. So I think okay. it's whoever was on the school board at that time. So the expectation is that senior English is less visual. <laughs> in it terms is a of highly, films. highly focused on um, reading and writing, mm -hmm. including college essay, um, a full-blown research paper. Okay. Um, again, we're still working on the curriculum. No, that's fine. I just want to make yes. sh make sure that yes. we're not going to have what amounts to two, two versions of, of this that is correct. called two different things. Yeah. That is correct. And, <clears throat> and in the spirit of the electives that either juniors or seniors can take, but that it's an option for that last half credit to equal four, that students have a wide range of choices, but maintaining rigor. I mean, you have mystery, you have short story, you have journalism, uh, you know, British literature. We have a wide variety of, of choices they don't all run every year depending on um, uh, registrations and so forth but we reconfigured the senior English for that purpose that I've described and then um, this one um, has a different focus for those students who enjoy film and yet um, incorporating the rigor of the literature and uh, at least one sample has gone to the English department there, there are many others um, but my own hope is that it's not just focused on comparing um, the same film in the same book, but also um, a, th a theme and how that's handled in literature uh, and a different vehicle in uh, film, that kind of thing. This, some version of this course is, is done in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. um, personally, my preference is for a version that, that doesn't look at Here's the book, here's the movie. <coughs> so let's take a look at the differences. There, I think there are some real advantages of looking at a more analytical piece, that look at character development in book versus character de development in movie, and not necessarily the same movie. In fact, there's some advantages to, to not use the same. Um, so this, this is a variation, I, I think it's a little lighter academically when it's done as a parallel watch a feature you know read a, uh, a book watch a feature length movie of the same book um, as opposed to here's a book that deals with help me out Julia the theme of conflict right prejudice I mean. and in this type of setting and it could be a 200 year old book and now here's a here's a current movie that deals with the same theme in a time frame 150 years later mm -hmm. now look at the theme look at the character development so there has to be something significant tying the two for a comparison but I think if it's always done here's a book here's the movie on the book it really limits the level of uh, literary analysis that, that and it really does fit with our new standards um, in terms of um, uh, analysis, citing evidence from whether it's a piece of literature or a film, uh, that level of complex thinking throughout. The other thing is that vis visualization is a major skill for reading. And so some students, and I happen to have a daughter who reminded me of that, and she's older now and still recognizes that she has difficulty visualizing and I think she didn't probably in her education have opportunities where she might see a play or, um, or a film under guidance where the discussion of how are these themes and topics visualized now when you read a piece of literature you now are to engage in this kind of visualizing um, so that you will have a deeper understanding of, of what's going on in this piece of literature. 
I'll make a motion to approve literature and the literature and film description. Second. Second. Any more discussion? All just, oh. just one other thing. Just because you know, I do. I don't want it to be a class of just watching movies. Um, are they? Is the plan that they watch a full-length movie, or is it sections of the movie that have the conflict comparison to literature? I think in this case there will be some of each, because unlike a history course, for instance, where you definitely would want to see many clips of certain historical events in a documentary, let's say, or, or something like that, um, that theme runs throughout a piece. And so in some cases, if you don't see the entire film, um, I'm sh I certainly want to encourage them to try to pick <coughs> outstanding shorter films as opposed to maybe a four or three or four hour film. But that depends on the quality and usefulness of the film. One of the things in our standards that I think I explained before about text complexity, one of the third components is um, task and the relationship of the uh, resource that's used to the student task that you're developing. So again, depending on what we want students to do with it, that's what would determine whether they would watch a clip or a few versus the entire film so that you see the beginning, middle, and end as you would with a piece of literature. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Stay. Motion carries 400. Well, I have for you. <coughs> are you staying for the program of studies, or are you, I am. you all set? Okay. Thank you. So, Julie, just yes. Um, I can't find anywhere where geometry was added as a graduation requirement in the policy or in the program of studies. So, it, what must have happened is it was in one of my reports as a recommendation. Um, in fact, it passed PERC, and probably what didn't happen is this, Michelle and I will research that that we didn't bring it back for a vote. Could Sometimes be. that happens. Uh, lately, Michelle and I have both been trying to keep track of the PERC recommendations and make sure that we, if we don't get them this night, we bring them back. So, um, yeah, and that's unfortunate because that may make a decision about whether or not we want it in the program of studies for, and typically we would do it for the incoming freshmen. I'm almost positive we did approve it. Well, it didn't make it into the graduation policy, and it's not listed as a requirement in the program of studies this year for the incoming freshmen. Right. Well, and that's why I asked. I didn't see it, but okay. if nobody made a note of it, we've had a change in our guidance director, it's possible that it got yep. missed. Yeah. And I also don't see where that your tool was ever approved. It was mentioned at a board meeting that it was developed, but it never came back and got so approved by the board. Like what do you mean? The Which one? In 2010? In 2010. Well, there's a note. There's a note in the minutes that Amanda said that Perk had developed a tool for doing um, curriculum. Or uh, well, the version you looked at previously. Um, so it may have been approved by the Perk, but I don't think it ever made it oh, okay. to the board for approval. Well, this board did approve the version that was brought in December. So we have sort of that piece of history. But I understand. I I only use the documents that. Oh, no, I, because I, 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 I don't remember the form ever coming, and, you know, Michelle's good about the minutes, and I went the uh, yep. uh, whole year of minutes. And I think what happened was Amanda was leaving, and yeah, the other um, curriculum director came in <coughs> somewhere and fell in between yeah. the cracks. Which is okay. We know what's going on. Studies. Did everybody get the um, Michelle the updated mm -hmm. version of that? Okay. So that it just makes it a lot more reader friendly to go through. I had um, one of our National Honor Society students look page by page um, versus the way it was nor laid out in the past. So um, is that generally how you do is just go page by page and ask questions and about any changes? 
I think we just we, we typically just cover the changes the unless changes. somebody has a yeah. question on a specific okay. page yes. yeah, from reading through. Go, go through, through the, the changes. Your, your revision doc and just say on page three we did this, why we did it, right? I mean, it does a pretty good job of almost hitting every page, <laughs> <laughs> even the revisions do. But um, obviously, with the we're updated the date on page one, and then moving on to um, the mission statement. That was a, a question that came about um, for us um, at the high school as well, that um, in May of 2013, the faculty had approved um, our mission statement, but uh, I spoke with Michelle maybe a month or so ago at this point um, and said that it was pending school board approval. I approve that too core beliefs or core values change yeah and we approve those yeah I didn't know the mission statement changed we, we had a huge discussion because um, if, if we go back what happened was you wanted to reverse um, three and two of social that's what we remember we had that whole thing on diversity yeah that, that was the conversation but that wasn't the mission statement no, that was that's, that's the, the core one. values. That's the beliefs. That's the beliefs. So yeah, the mission still. I thought we approved it with that change. I thought you did too with the change. That's what I you said, but no one could find it. No, though the, but I thought the you core approved beliefs. it as long as we. Yes. yes. We didn't change the mission statement. It was just no, the beliefs. No, I think th I thought it. Yeah, was, I think it's approved. No I just don't know when it was. Yeah. In the spring. And that's what I, I remembered. Spring, Michelle yeah. couldn't yeah. find it. Like so if you could yeah. just approve it again. <laughs> yeah. So I think you just need to flip two and three there, and then Michelle can probably give you the date. So that should be a not a new mission statement, but a revised page one, whatever that beliefs. Yeah, yeah we did. We did flip values. two and three. Right. Revised this core values. Normal yeah. Too. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. That was the Michelle agrees right. with me. That happens every now and again. <laughs> you wanted diversity. Don't let it go to your head. <laughs> so that is correct. No, no, no. Don't let Dr. Cochran uh, go to his head. That's what I'm saying. Oh, I thought you were looking at I Michelle. <laughs> Michelle does a good job of helping keep me humble. That's a nice one. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and then on page two, obviously, we had to um, update the course selection process to put the appropriate dates in for this year. Um, as you can see on page two, where our course selection portal for Edline does open on. Wednesday, March 5th. Um, so we're going to keep that process moving along pretty nicely and expect to have um, that wrapped up by the 14th of March. Um, other changes on this page? There were none. Um, on page three, um, as Julie had pointed out to me, just for consistency, um, I changed information and communications technology. The wording was a little different from last year, so that's just to um, stay consistent throughout the program of studies. And then under competencies, um, Julie had suggested to change the language. Core competencies are the concepts and skills of a course um, rather than the previous language. Main ideas. Which is main ideas, right. So concepts um, instead of main ideas. Just a side note, yep. the, that definition of a competency is fairly dated and inconsistent with the, the state approved, which really requires a, a DOK of three, um, requires the application or transfer of concepts rather than just knowledge of concepts. Knowledge of concepts really isn't, if you use Fred Bramante's example of what is a competency knowing the concepts of how a plane flies is great but you really probably want your, your your pilot to be able to actually apply those concepts and land the plane safely so concepts by and of themselves from my perspective do not indicate they're necessary for competence but they're not they're insufficient so that's a conversation for another day 
So one thing on this section, we, we say competencies in some cases, in some cases we say core competencies. While I think they're the same thing, it reads as two different things to someone that hasn't dealt with competencies like coming out of the middle school. And I don't know which way, but I think we just want to standardize. Be consistent once to be again. consistent so that, because mm -hmm. we say competencies, then we say core, 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 then we say competency and credit recovery. Yeah, you're right, right. Would you prefer the language to be core competencies, Lori? I think and so. Then, okay. Well, if I may, there really is a difference. Um, core competencies could be uh, defined as the cross-cutting competencies, the school-wide expectations as the um, uh, NEASC defines them of things like uh, writing across the curriculum and um, communication, those kinds of things. Competencies might include very specific content-related competencies. The state has released um, content competencies in English language arts and math. So down the road, we may need to make a distinct, that, that have both for one purpose or another. Well, you would, we would just have to make sure that that would carry through such that somebody would on their right. report card have competencies and or core competencies as it's called out. But here, I think we're just using them interchangeably. Right. I, I, the reason I shared that is I think that because we aren't at the point of making the distinction, it might be better to use the term, just the word competencies, rather than... Yeah. Rather than using core, just use Does competencies. Does that make sense in terms of the history, Lori? Yeah, I, well, I think that the history is they always said core, but I'm okay with competencies because I agree with what you're saying. There's going to be changes, and so just saying competencies and then working towards more details as they come is fine with me. Okay, so I'll just change, I'll take out anything that says core in here as we go down. Um, then we're out on page four, and I think this is probably a spot that Lori can help me out with um, for history purpose, but um, in previous program of studies, there was a section about freshman e-folio. Um, that was removed, and I know that Lori has the history on that freshman e-folio piece and why it would be removed. Um, we actually, um, different teachers do different things, but freshman seminar is covering some of the uh, portfolio information, and um, Julie's working on getting a, a better system with all of that because uh, what we eventually want to have is selected pieces of work, not just any piece of work, so that's why. Okay. Um, and then we looked at revising the changes for honors option. Um, past practice has been that when grade verifications, it was if a student wanted to do an honors option in a class, they met with their teacher and filled out a contract and worked out the details with the teacher. Um, the guidance office was not made aware of who those students were until grade verifications were given to teachers. Um, so the grading process has been um, really difficult because then we're going back and adding sections for certain students who are doing the honors option classes in order to input grades. So the we're just going to front load everything. Yeah, we're just so trying to get it before easier. instead of later. Be proactive in the process. Is there also a, a change from who determines what work is required from under the old one it's implied that the student makes a proposal that's approved as opposed to the teacher determining? Well the contracts are all going to be pretty much the same kind of contract so we're going to have common language and common contracts. But does it mean that if, that if I have four honor students in the same class, four in the honors option, that four kids are doing four different things? No, they or do the same. And that is the, the additional line that was added in there as well, was that the teacher will assign rigorous coursework to earn the honors credits, so there is that consistency as well. And if there's not an honors course, students have the opportunity to complete courses at an honors option level, so that's just additional wording. Um, to clarify and create less confusion in that process. 
Would it then be appropriate to change the word proposal to contract? Because the, the students aren't making the proposal. Oh, because then the next line says completed contracts. Right. I guess does the student propose it and then it becomes a contract? Maybe a proposal is as so simple as go to the teacher and say, hey, I want to do honors. <coughs> Except in the past, I think sometimes students actually proposed what work they would do. Yeah. So I don't know if the history <coughs> makes a, changes the meaning of it. I'm sure students are best place to be yeah. identifying what. They might have choices, but they're the teacher's choices. It also <laughs> lead to some of those questions about <coughs> honors work really seems to be more not. I'm going to do 20 problems instead of 10. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got the first 10 right. Guess how much I'm going to learn in the next <coughs> um, A question. Mm -hmm. if, if a student takes, an, takes honors English uh, and gets a C, do they get the GPA bump? But someone that takes honors option and gets a C doesn't get the GPA bump. Let me look at right According to what it says in the, it says if they do it with a B or better, students will receive an honors designation. Students earning the, uh, earning the honors option will have an additional .5 calculated into the GPA. Handbook. Well, that's actually right here. It's on yeah, page four. Yeah. They get a B or yes. That's by correct. An additional .5 calculated in. Are we if just you got a B. Are we four point five, or yes. are we talking about? That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. If you get a B, you get a 3.5. Mm -hmm. If you get an A plus, you get a 4.5. But here, if I got a, if I took this and got a C, I would just get two. Is there a reason there's a differentiation? I'm just asking because I don't know. Honors is a higher standard, then it I should be a higher standard for each letter. Right. <laughs> right. I know. Right. I got an F, but I got a 0.5. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of it that way. I wonder if in the history of the school, however, there was some thought about if it's an official honors course, and so the honors is woven throughout the course. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just asking. Then if no. I, well, I, think the the course is I think the option. history was they didn't have as many honors classes, so they did a lot of honors options. options. And we've been moving to honors classes and getting rid of honors option, you know, trying to offer more mm -hmm. honors classes. But if we can't do it, then we'll do the honors option. But I think if you go back to the history. I, I'm okay if it's that way. I'm just trying to. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. Somebody will ask. I know. I'm thinking Logically, historically. Though, it, it does not make sense that if the, if the, the if teacher has approved it as a higher standard right. and they get the same grade against the higher standard. That's that the last. If we yeah. differentiate in every other place in GPA, why would we not differentiate here? So maybe you just need to get rid of the grade B or better and say a passing grade. Clearly, you'd have to get a passing grade, I think. To Otherwise, you get no credits. Well, you, you get an F, you get no credits, but you get a 0.5. Where's your GPA? 0.5. <laughs> 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 yeah, but I'm not sure it matters. <laughs> Literally translated, that, that, that would be what mm -hmm. we have. <laughs> yeah. So um, should I put a passing grade and remove I grade yeah, B I would just, instead of grade B or better, I would just say a passing grade. Okay. Okay. With a passing grade, it doesn't even have to be in parentheses. Okay. All right. Um, page five. Um, this is where we get into discussion of dual enrollment. Um, here, there was really only a little bit of wording changed. Obviously, we had to update the the dates for the courses um, to 2015, 14, 15 school year. And then we um, added in here that this fee is due to the classroom teacher by September 15th. Um, there was a little confusion about where the money had to go and by when. So we wanted to make sure that people understood that if this was going to be an option that they chose, that there is a deadline <coughs> for the monies um, to be given into the classroom. Um, the 
only other thing here that we were looking at changing is in that last paragraph under dual enrollment was that the application and fee will be collected through the guidance office during the first month of school. Again, that's um, removed so that the classroom teacher would be collecting that money and then uh, a member of the guidance department would collect the money from the teacher instead of it coming <coughs> through different sources. Um, the AP program, next down here, uh, again, just dates, 2014-15 dates put in, 13-14 removed. It's about the only thing that we made a change. Which is nice, the AP exam cost hasn't gone up yet, so it's still $89 per exam. So we didn't have to make any changes there. The following page, we made an adjustment. So under the junior area, the recommended sequence now shows um, to stay with Common Core would be the American Studies English and American Studies Social Studies is now under the junior requirement and will be back and running. Um, so that's under the junior area. And then under the four-year planning worksheet, we also made that adjustment there under grade 11 to just have American Studies under the English and Social Studies requirements. And we removed anything that said World Studies under the juniors. As you know, it's going to be going into the sophomore world. Uh, page 7, we did change some wording um, here about kneecaps. Um, Actually, that may be better. The, the RSA says the, the New Hampshire State Assessment Program, uh, which will change over time. So it may be better to say juniors are required to participate in the New Hampshire State Assessment Program, which State next Assessment year will Program? Be, yeah. Okay. Um, and then we added the line in there to include the Smarter Balance Assessment that will be administered. Um, Here's my question, and Dr. Cochran probably has this answer. Um, right now, I said it's during the spring of 2015. Is that incorrect? As of now, 2000, uh, 2015 is correct. Okay. If, if, I mean, right now, the, the state assessment program stipulates smarter balance. So if you put in New Hampshire state assessment program, that's defined by the RSA, then you can leave out smarter balance. Okay. So, for example, it also stipulates uh, kneecap science in the spring. But, and, and you know, those will change as of my meeting today. It may even change if we get to waiver 2.0 because we have a three year plan on a two year waiver. So I just, I'm just <laughs> sitting here <laughs> with, at the edge of my seat, hmm. waiting to see what comes. Also, um, and also then again, the down below under um, AP, I, we did list SAT and PSAT, ACT T dates for upcoming dates. Um, these are also posted online for our students to see. Tried not to predict too far out because um, they change. So we only predicted out <coughs> through the end of this school year um, in the program of studies. Just to let you know. Yep. Back to the New Hampshire State Assessment. Yeah. You're missing a two between re required and take. I think you want a required to take. You see what I'm saying? All juniors <coughs> are required to take. Ah, yes. Mm hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank goodness other people were. <laughs> um, and then the next uh, changes would be on page 9. Um, under course 2104 and 2204 World Studies, um, the one change under that area was that um, Charles Dickens is added to the list of texts that would be read at that level. And of course, that's again, that's a sophomore class, so that is adjustment as well. Um, down below under American Studies, 2102, 2202, um, there was, we added a note in there that it is a requirement of all juniors, unless they're taking an honors American Studies. 
page 10. Um, this is where we get into <laughs> the senior English. So Dennis, you can take a look at that there. One line that um, Lori and I had talked about adding here is that um, I would have the opportunity to take a look at the curriculum for added district coursework to see if it might meet the senior English requirement. Um, this isn't something that we've encountered very much. There's been maybe one or two limited cases this year where there was um, re really very special reasons for a student to need to take a, a, a senior related English class in Nashua Night School or Londonderry Night School. So um, that would just give me the opportunity to make that judgment call if an opportunity needed to be, you know, come up for a student. Will it meet our Would it meet our standards? Yeah. And, and so they just can't decide themselves, I'm going to go take this English class and transfer it back and it's going to take the place of senior English. We would have to is this just a special case of the normal procedure of having a director of guidance do a transcript analysis looking at you know? um i agree with you um i don't know that that's necessarily how that is perceived in in the building um i think there's a perception with well this is a graduation requirement they have to take this there's no flexibility around that so that's why we thought the wording there would maybe clarify that my perspective is that that's why we hire you. Well, me Let's too. Yeah, but <laughs> I don't Michelle, think I'll sure get, get all the votes. Yeah. That's when you say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. But May I have you, another? <laughs> you report to the principal. You're the director of guidance. You're the person who's supposed to know from college to this school to other school what translates in and not. Right. And if you have a question, you would bring it to your boss and if she has a question she would bring it to her boss and that your say is final unless you know you'd like Lori's opinion on it quite honestly I don't think teachers have the their the, their role is not to do transcript analysis that's clearly a guidance and administrative function and I think that needs to be clear and if I could add that all transfer credit is subject to review and that review should the major part of that is to compare it to our curriculum just as colleges do and say that it meets the vast majority of the criteria in our own curriculum and once our curriculum is completed that that will be an easier task right now when you just have a description that's harder to do than when you have the detailed curriculum and, and I think it's fair if, if, if a teacher has a question to be able to come and say hey I <coughs> see that this came in as X you know are we sure that it meets X, this requirement sure. right right but, but I think in the end right we don't have any residency requirements meaning none of we, none of our courses must be taken <coughs> on site that they're excluded from uh, transfer credit. At least we don't at this time. Okay. So I can take that line out and we're okay. Yes. I wonder if we need a generic statement in there somewhere about, in the case of transfer students, the director of guidance. There's a policy already yeah, that says, say that uh, I think the principal determines the appropriate entry point based on the transcript from the sending school. I know it states that the, that the principal can assign students to classes. Is that the same Isn't that what it piece? Is. Mm -hmm. Because we're... Well, I know there's one There's one about the, it's like the age of entrance, and it talks about you've got to be five by this date to start kindergarten, six by this date to go into first grade. And then if you're transferring in, the principal, for any other grade, the principal can Assign you, to grade. assign you to the appropriate grade for our district based upon where you, which might be I mean I guess it's the same it's lower or it's higher based upon where you're this coming is slightly from. Different it's a little different what you, about what you're doing is you're, you're signing team. credit yeah. for, for well I'm assuming at the high school it would have to be in order if you were going to assign so, a transfer student in as a sophomore they would have to have six credits that transfer as a minimum or we couldn't classify them as a sophomore right but 
they could in their previous institution have courses in a different order or something so you really might be in a situation to accept transfer credit that meet a requirement that we have at a higher grade for instance so their grade standing might be a little different than what courses that you're accepting whether the student is advanced or not we should look that up I don't recall but I thought we had so someone has uh, has taken a true credit integrated science as a freshman at Pinkerton and then transfer here well what whose decision is it well, what we do with that that's an administrative decision now it might be informed with a conversation with the science curriculum facilitator but I think in the end it's clearly administrative function in the same way that the registrar's office at a university has the final say on what transfers in or not. You might word that, that all seniors would be required to earn senior English credit and therefore could be earned somewhere else before coming here if it's comparable. Actually, the policy doesn't say anything about high school. Incoming transfer students in grades 2 to 8 inclusive will be placed in accordance with the grade level forwarded by the sending school district. Such placement is tentative and subject to reassignment by the superintendent or designee, which I assume would be. But might there not be a separate policy? In my other district, we had a separate yeah, policy. Yeah, I don't think there is. I think we only have the one. Hmm. But. <coughs> Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. <laughs> Just keep going. Right, I know, right. Um, senior English, the last sentence, students will be expected to complete a major writing assignment. We added that in there. It should be no mystery, but I think, um, again, just to clarify that they are going to have a major re research paper in there. Brit Lit, um, the prerequisite. Uh, Lori thought would be more appropriate at a grade of a B or better rather than a B plus um, in order to um, meet the prerequisite for that class and then we made a note there that the course is recommended for students considering majors in English or history um, so hopefully you can get some numbers in and run that class this year um, on page 11 the only change there was a note under honor senior English and the note is that this course may be taken in place of regular senior English. Again, just a clarification there. And then page 12 is the literature and film class um, that Julie just um, spoke to you about through Park. Um, page 13, Lincoln Reconstructed. <coughs> Again, the prerequisite was adjusted uh, for a grade of B or equivalent in all. Um, we didn't have any grade prerequisite in the previous program of studies. You said, wait, on page 13, Yep. was it for 22-23 advanced placement U.S. history? No. Uh, no, that was Link oh, it would be Lincoln Reconstructed 2219 okay. yep. um, was added, okay. the prerequisite was added for that class. It is, it is, he, he makes it very interesting and, and very rigorous, so it kind of just gives the kids a heads up that there's a lot expected of them when they're taking his course. Page 14, um, course 2302, of course, is the new pre-algebra daily class. I will make that adjustment um, with the one credit math slash one credit elective, so I'll make that adjustment there. Uh, page 15, uh, 2310, Algebra 2, grade of a C plus or better. In Algebra 1, we need to change that. Algebra 1 or geometry, not applied algebra. I have no idea what applied algebra is, so that's a typo. Um, honors, Algebra 2, grade of B plus or above in Algebra 1 or instructor's permission was added as a prerequisite. <coughs> and then 2323 calculus a prerequisite is pre-calc. Again, seems like it's an obvious thing, but it is a clarification. We ha I had a number of students come to me this year 
asking if they could just jump from Algebra 2 to Calculus. <laughs> I don't have a picture how that would work, but it and did again, have a just, request. And I don't know if, if this is already known, but our pre-calculus is sort of a combination of trig, you know, what other schools might call it different. Not every school uses the term pre-calc, so I don't think you have to put it in here, but in terms of transfer credit. Okay. Yeah, it does mention that in the in the description for pre-calc a little bit, but um, that is that's helpful in looking at that. Page 16, um, college prep math number 2327. That is the other class um, or only other class in the program of studies that currently does not meet NCAA eligibility requirements. Um, I will try again this year to submit that class to see if I can have that approved. Mm -hmm. No, that won't no. be approved. It's really a okay. recomposition of algebra and geometry. Okay, that's why so. they don't approve it. Okay. Yeah. And that's understandable. It is. Yeah, that one definitely And the sense. course, as it's stated in here, is to prepare students who are not yet prepared to take a particularly community college level math. There are typically two reasons, just to clarify, why courses don't receive NCAA approval for a core subject. One is that the, the subject is taught below a high school level or be, be below the grade level. And the other is that it, it doesn't qualify for a core. For So the film and lit course, or literature and film course, uh, is taught at, at a high school level, but it doesn't meet the core English requirement, but it can uh, reach in like other cases, like our basic science courses would not receive NCAA credit because they're taught at a lower level, potentially, than the regular academic level. So if it's anything that's taught below the regular academic level, NCAA does not allow it as meeting a core requirement. A question on college prep math. Mm -hmm. The last two sentences just seem like they're out of place. With an appropriate score, students may take the topics and apply college mathematics, either at CHS for dual enrollment, blah, 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 blah. It just doesn't, I realize the test that they're going to take is referenced there, but <clears throat> I guess I don't understand why that would be under college prep math and not under topics in applied college mathematics, which is what it's actually referencing. It, because it, it's trying to, and maybe we need different words, but, but I'm responsible for that, so I'll speak to it. It's because um, in order to be eligible for topics in applied college math, they have to, um, it sh there's a word missing, with an appropriate score on the acuplacer. On the acuplacer? Yes. Okay. Right, which is, which is, I'm assuming it's just because <clears throat> the acuplacer is what's being talked about in the previous two sentences. Right. Um, students may then take topics in applied math for dual enrollment may credit. May then take. Okay. Right. Well, why wouldn't that just be a prerequisite for topics in applied because math? Because you could actually take Algebra 2 instead and then take the take math. You actually, if you get an... A well, it actually says down there on the, or a passing score on the Accuplacer exam. That's fine. I, I just seemed like it was referencing the course below and not... Yeah. We felt it needed more clarification because some questions had been asked. Student can actually go to take math after geometry because the acuplacer only has Algebra 1 and geometry on it. So they don't need college prep math. It's that course in some places is called senior math, um, which is not a very attractive term. Um, and <laughs> since we were saying that we want to say for community college in the workplace, you know, so students would take it a little more <coughs> seriously and be encouraged to take math primarily their senior year so they would be ready for the take math in college, but they could accelerate that by taking college prep math their junior year. Some of our kids um, have trouble with the three credits, and right now, it, unless they were taking pre-algebra, their credits would be Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. And we have some kids where Algebra 2 is not suitable, or they're not that interested in math, because Algebra 2 is really the four-year college uh, type of math. Um, so we really wanted to emphasize this course, and working with the community college system, they had a design curriculum, so it worked out well for us. 
Um, and then last in the math section is the AP Calculus BC description um, that was talked about previously. Um, on page 18, for science and science yeah. required for graduation. <coughs> Um, honors biology, the description I know was reworded from the previous program of studies. Um, with the new curriculum facilitator in science, she wanted to um, use wording that and topics that were more rigorous, so she did change the wording on honors biology. Page 26. Um, actually, it's 25 onto 26. So, class website design number 2627. We added a note there that college course credit um, can only be given to juniors and seniors who opt for the running start um, and dual enrollment college credit. Uh, if we have students that are sophomores doing the website design, they would not be eligible in order to get the credit. So we wanted to make a note of that so that there was there was no confusion there. 2628 computer programming, that was a possible running start course that we had discussed maybe for next year. I know Sean McDonough is looking into that right now to see what he could do to make that happen. And then 2629 Digital Publishing, same note, college course credit can only be given to juniors and seniors. Just a clarification there. Advanced Web Design, again, the next class down, a note added there as a possible running start course for the upcoming year. As well as the one below, number 2634, Advanced Computer Programming, is also a possible running start course for 2014-15. On the following page, um, page 27, uh, there was a renaming. Uh, 2702 is now Creative Foods and Nutrition. <coughs> what was it called? Oh, creative Cooking? Creating cook, Creative Cooking? Creative. I know. I think it was in, Intro to Foods. No, that's right there. No, it was Creative Cooking. Creative Cooking. cooking. That's creative. Right. creative Cooking is now Creative Foods and Nutrition. Um, again, that's just the component of um, being able to make sure that students understand that there is a nutrition component, it's not just cooking. Um, child Development 1 and Child Development 2, I realized I made an error, so I need to fix that. It's actually Child Development and Parenting 1 and Child Development and Parenting 2, so I need to add in the terms and parenting on both areas. Um, and then under Child Development 2, we added the prerequisite that you have to complete one before you get to two. Again, there's there's different ages that the students work with depending on if they're in one or two. Some people are just saying, well, I don't want to study about babies birth to five. I would rather look at five and up. And I said, well, that's not the way they're born. So you got to do one <laughs> before two. <There> <laughs> Can't put the Some car people would horse. like to have them born at three. <laughs> Just uh, sleeping through the night is mm, Yeah, that would have been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> On page 30, um, under music exploration, number 2906, the only thing there under the note, um, the course music exploration will not be running in the upcoming school year. It is a course that runs every other year, so we made a note that the courses will not run again until 2015-16. So just before we go off this page, yeah. I know we had a conversation um, at some point in the past about chorus, concert, choir, and concert band. What are the differentiators between one, two, three, and four? Because they can take it each year for credit. Has that been laid out yet? I have not gotten any proposals. It is standard practice, but there needs to be an explanation to go with it as to why it happens in, in music and, and how does that relate to the grades? <coughs> and the competencies. Because I know that was a point of discussion with the strength training and we only went to strength training. With those descriptions. Two. No, I think we only got to two. Three. To okay, three, three. Not four. Right. Because there wasn't enough differentiation and we, we 
we, the greater we, was going to come back with how all courses fit into that. So. <coughs> And then on page 33, um, digital photography, number 2957, that is an updated description that uh, Denise Freeman has added in here to work with technology appropriately. <laughs> um, number 2958 is now graphic design. It was previously graphic arts. And then obviously 2960 would have to be advanced graphic design. Um, and the prerequisite below, successful completion of graphic design. So we had to go through and change the art into design all over the place there. Under in 2962, same thing, prerequisite graphic design. And you'll note the same thing on page 34. Um, and it is in, in both places because that class has the ability to be counted as an R or um, a technology credit. So again, it's using the terminology graphic design and advanced graphic design versus the graphic arts. The only other um, changes that are in here um, are to the vocational programs. Um, and obviously those were out of our ability to change so I just took what Alvern and Nashua sent to me and updated and removed any of the programs that are no longer offered. Um, both Alvern and Nashua uh, representatives from the career and tech ed departments were here today to talk to our sophomores about the different opportunities for them um, and there seemed to be a lot of interest this year from the students in the various programs at both schools so um, we shall see on the number of applications that come through for those career and tech ed programs. We only budgeted for 29. <laughs> <laughs> Any yeah, more I questions know, right? on the program of study? <laughs> May I ask? Um, unless it would be a protracted discussion, I guess we'd have to figure that out. Uh, would we be willing to entertain the idea of geometry as a graduation requirement so that it can appear in the program of studies? I already thought we did so before. Yeah. I guess I just feel very strongly about it and that a part of the discussion that we had before was that the vast majority of our students already do so, but for those who don't, um, I think in it, and it's also worth noting there's also a strong chance that it's going to appear in the final adoption of the revised minimum standards going to the legislature but we would at least have that so that our incoming freshman families will be aware of that uh, I don't remember whether we approved it or not but <coughs> I know we had a long discussion so I'd like to make a motion to add Geometry as a graduation requirement. I'll second it. Starting in year. I think he wants. Oh, he wants. Year it, you know, motion. he always says it that way. It makes it sound like he's. What year would that be starting? It'll be Wait, incoming class, class of 2018. 2018. Class of 2018. <coughs> All right. So I make a motion, as you. I'll second it then. We need to bring the policy back then and add that as a specific the graduation requirements policy. Okay. And it probably affects the handbook in addition to the program of studies, I would think. Right. Yep. Any more discussion? So we need to make sure that goes All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Stay. Motion carries 4 zero, zero. Okay, well set. Principal, principal's report? Um, I was going to say, so we've discussed a lot of things that I was going to say, but <laughs> I, I will continue on. Sure. Um, so we're very excited about our kneecap improvement and growth and uh, so I'd like to you know congratulate the teachers at Campbell High School but I'd also like to thank the school board because I think when um, I came to you two years ago to ask for everyday geometry we were looking to improve math scores and uh, that was I think a, a really important system that we put into place to help support students that were struggling and I believe that was partially the reason I also think that you know um, Dr. Heon and Dr. Sharma and, and with all the work with, with math, uh, we're starting to see some results. So I think that's all really good. Um, if you look um, 
the second page assessment and growth of kneecap we were actually the front page of the telegraph and that was actually a good thing because they said good things about <laughs> us um, but on the bottom it there's a part on growth and uh, when we look at um, a difference of an eight-year growth you can see that our number is actually the highest of the list of, of 28 so that's that was very good we we're happy about that well, yes and no we started lower than everybody else at 20 instead of the state average of 28 given Correct. The, the other we have <laughs> only a third of the free and reduced lunch count of the state average so the, the Telegraph isn't known for a psychometric evaluation, so I'm not sure that that's especially <laughs> valid. It is showing a good trend. Great. Uh, but the, the huge growth of 28, you know, and we're above the state average now, which is where we should be. And we knew um, before we started, you know, in 2007, that when the scores were so uh, poor, that it was, you know, because the kids were making Christmas trees. We've had those discussions before and turning in those results. So, you know, to get the students to take the test seriously was an important thing. Um, if you look on the next page, this just shows us in comparing to other towns. And uh, you can see that, um, you know, free and reduced lunch were at 9%. So when you look at other towns that have 9%, uh, you know a couple of our towns you know like Goffstown and Guilford they have a higher free and reduced lunch and they also have higher scores but a lot of the schools that uh, have nine percent free and reduced also Merrimack and London Dairy uh, Hudson have lower scores than, than than us so I think that's important growth and it's a, it gives you looking at uh, surrounding towns where where we're falling and we just seem to keep moving up which is what we want it to have happen uh, the freshman seminar uh, that's also in there uh, when we put freshman seminar in I promised you that we would do an evaluation by the students um, I think Trish asked for the evaluation so this is the data from the students to see um, you know did they find that the course was a valuable course um, this is the results of that survey for you um, we have hired a math tutor which we're excited about um, as far as acknowledgments go um, my first acknowledgement because I, I don't think I'll be at um, the board at another board meeting before Trish leaves is to thank Trish for her thoughtful deliber deliberations um, I really appreciated working with her in park she was uh, very thoughtful and and she put a lot of time and hard work and and I appreciated that um, we had 23 students and staff raised um, $6,800 for Special Olympics. Um, we actually won first place for Division Three schools. And I'm just going to quickly uh, read the names of the students that jumped in the ocean because I think they deserve that. <laughs> um, we have Mandy Miller, Amber Gibbons, Caitlin Heaton, Andrew Picard, Jake Bambaca, Connor Gannon, Angela Valente, Christian Camacho, Brittany McNulla, Emily Paquin, Katie Keene, Amanda Simino, Samantha Raymond, Christine Mara, Ariel Flesher, Sam Munley, Lindsay Murnock, Valerie Hubbard, and Zach Perot. And so uh, that was awesome. Um, this year, we are going to uh, continue to recognize high achieving students. So um, what we came up this year was uh, honor roll cards, which I'll give you a little show and tell. We had 156 students who were named to the honor roll first semester, and uh, we'll be sending out a, a Cougar card congratulating them from the honor. Uh, we had 40 <coughs> students who reached high honors, and we also had 40 students that did not meet academic eligibility for co-curricular um, based on our policy. Um, the fashion show was a hit on Sunday night, uh, another great event. Uh, we had to postpone it from Saturday because of the snowstorm, but we were really happy with the turnout. Girls Varsity Softball State Champion banner was raised last week in the gym. Um, two of our swimmers, Mike Douglas and Grant Lavasser, placed second in states, which was amazing. They were uh, 
Michael Douglas was like this much away. It was almost like the Olympics. Um, I'd like to thank Gil Walton for his fine super, um, service to the Booster Club. He was the Booster President for the last few years. I think he did an outstanding job. He was very dedicated to Campbell High School. I think he lived here. You know, he was just, every time you turn around there was Gil. So I, I want to really appreciate it. I also like to uh, welcome our new um, President, uh, Kerry Gannon. Um, Sean Munley won the state ch championship in uh, winter track. He's um, only a junior. He is amazing. I think he'll probably go Division One. And if you ever get a chance to go to a track meet, it's just he just flies. I mean, the kids. I'm like, wow. I don't know. It's it's really <laughs> awesome. Um, CHS is um, going to have a PTO finally, so uh, I'm very excited about that because um, <coughs> the PTO is going to, you know, start supporting us the way other schools are supported with, you know, um, snacks and things like that for teachers and, and things for students. Um, one of the things that they already did, which I was very excited about, is um, homework club meets every day and we wanted to have snacks for the kids so they already brought in all of these snacks for the kids to have after school so I was excited um, <clears throat> the student exchange program um, I don't want you, you feel like you have to vote tonight but I just wanted to give you a quick overview of this uh, and then uh, possibly look for a vote next time uh, Jody and I and um, mr. Perez met with Bow High School about um, international students and um, there's uh, <clears throat> there's two different types of international students there's F1s and J1s and the J1 kids would be the focus that we would like to focus on um, again um, the uh, if we would get this passed it would cost us two thousand dollars to apply to be one of these international schools the J-1 kids would pay tuition. They would pay uh, $12,500 to go to Campbell per year. And they would also, uh, their homestay fees would be $9,200. And um, currently what happens when uh, we have a student, um, we don't get any money for that student. So um, we would be looking to, to apply and then um, we would have the opportunity to uh, decide whether the student was a match for us and it would make our, um, you know, it would give us revenue and we would have culture diversity. Um, if the student misbehaves in any way, we can send them home and we don't have to refund their money. Um, so we know that um, according to John Hausmeyer in, in, in Bo, they're like really, really nice students who just really want to have an American experience in high school. So it's something to think about. And I know Frank's going, where are you going to get that money, Lori? I don't know. I'm just, <laughs> Frank, he's not even smiling. <laughs> okay, and. Smile after nine o'clock, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, eighth grade parent night is um, March 24th and the reason that I put the Red Sox game in is if a school board member would like to go um, we could get tickets for them to go to the Red Sox with our seniors and juniors um, if you wanted to to be a part, sit in bleacher seats and celebrate with us. I know I went to that last year with my daughter well most of my family went I think it was a pretty good time it's fun. other than the fact that 30th. our bus got hit on the way home oh yeah that's right <laughs> You didn't get back till like you midnight. That little detail. That little we, detail. we literally <laughs> wired the bumper on a Cadillac up with Coach Patterson's lanyard from his whistle. The guy was adamant not to call the police. I could not understand why. <laughs> you want five considerations for <laughs> No, I got a pretty good idea. Uh, just to add, um, Caitlin Heaton was the co president yes. of the group that put on that penguin plunge which you think it's a bunch of people show up and go in the ocean but it's not it's a it's a nine in the morning to 1 30 in the afternoon kind of thing I actually I didn't go in the water I just went and provided some maybe next support. year maybe no next year. it's no it's the beach is fine <laughs> um, and uh, Sean Munnelly uh, when he ran actually beat division one people wow. uh, from division uh, students from division one schools in track which is very Amazing. rare for yeah, that's why I said three. he's gonna go division one I mean I just can't believe how fast he is I got an opportunity to go to Dartmouth and watch him and he just he was just so much fun 
couple of clarifications. The, the teacher evaluations for freshman seminar are actually, it's not a course evaluation, it's a teacher behavior evaluation, which is a very different thing. So like I said earlier that, that we need to look at evaluating new programs. The, the questions really are, are specific to, other than the first one, which really talks about problem solving and critical thinking. Right? And there are a couple of other words in there, but most of them deal with, with teacher behavior as opposed to course value and, and that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing is I did have a chance to talk to Dean Cascaden, uh, Superintendent in Bow. Uh, I got a little bit more clarity than, than you were able to get from John Hausmeyer, the principal at Bow High School. Um, the other major difference in the visa is that in, a, in the situation that we have now, students are limited to a one-year come and stay, no charge to us, and but essentially no cost either. And so it does some good things in terms of, of, of uh, diversity. They're typically very good students, and if there are issues, as we've seen from past years, then the students tend to disappear. Um, under this program, now, Dean thought that, that the cost would be closer to the $10,000 like the application itself is 2,000, but that the, the actual cost up front would be closer to 10,000. Um, but uh, uh, the other nice thing is that if a student comes, they don't have to come one year pay and then go back home. They can actually stay for four years. So the actual did, cost. Did you say where that money? Because um, the uh, extra $10,000 that it that we'd have to pay because he no, they only told it, us the overall cost in terms of the process and legal and, and that sort of thing he thought he thought that that uh, it would be closer to 10 but one student one year he said would would more than cover mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. the, uh, the fees the other question uh, how does that affect um, or does it not affect someone that might just be participating in some kind of foreign exchange where you know somebody from Europe because I, I they usually pay so if you're someone's going to come here now like if it's um, one of the uh, F1 visa kids it that is only a one-year agreement and they pay a company and so the money goes to the company and then the student comes here and no one gets any funding but you know they bring a lot of you know diversity well I mean that's so that's what I'm I guess what I'm asking is how is this different yeah so the the J1 visa kids um, you need to get you need to be a school that's going to be uh, it's called a, a CVIS uh, SEVIS school and if you're that in it it's a month-long process it costs approximately two hundred um, two um, thousand dollars from there what happens is the students will pay tuition to come okay. and most of the kids would be um, coming from, um, they're all international students about, um, right now they say in New Hampshire we have about 3,000 international students, but this would be from that same pool, but they would, <coughs> they would be paying the money directly to us. Okay. Yeah, we have a Just a book. conversation, if, if the district decides to proceed with this, um, one of the questions would be who pays the money and who receives the funds and my suggestion would be that that would be a district function <coughs> so the cost I agree I agree decided. the only other thing that they said that um, they would recommend John Hausmeyer would recommend that we did hire somebody um, with that money as an overseer because they said that um, foreign exchange students a lot of times it takes them a long time to you know to really um, feel welcomed in America so if you had somebody who was thinking doing activities and bringing them in that it would be a better experience for them so that was one recommendation he's actually getting his doctorate in, in um, his uh, thesis and everything is on this program mm -hmm. We have a pickleball donation too for CHS. Sorry. Pickleball. Yes. So um, the Pickleball Association of Litchfield would like to <laughs> donate six um, pickleball portable nets to the high school. Is the Pickleball Association of Litchfield disbanding? Is that what I, don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't. I think they want us to. Uh, yeah. I don't. The I, I think they want us to to start playing pickleball. I don't know. <laughs> 
Do you have a motion to accept the pickleball donation? I make a motion to accept the pickle donation for, I don't have a full lump pin there, but as written. I'll second it. Any discussion? So is this donation coming with the expectation of use of the facility? Um, probably at some point in time, they're probably going to want to have pickleball tournaments or something too. Just, there's a little note that says I would yep. like to see it done at Campbell High. Right. Pickleball. Yep. I don't think I ever played pickleball. I'd like to mm -hmm. congratulate the administration on the NECAP data comparison that shows the school performing much better in comparison to similar schools in the local area. Excellent job in the data representation. If you look at us com where we were compared to Londonderry, Merrimack, and others, uh, clearly there's been a major shift over the last four to five years. So, good job. Nice graphic. Thank you. A lot, a lot of people deserve credit for that. Always in favor of the pick and donation. Yeah, we did. We have <laughs> oh, <laughs> Is pick a ball in or out? Okay, pick a ball's in. Four zero zero. Okay. But yes, very good job. All right, thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Fishing, we can leave, right? <laughs> yeah, you got your. All right, set. thanks, everyone. I, I want to say the um, program of studies was in much better shape than it was Nobody last year. Check. So, Is thank you. But yes. Oh, no, that's true. We need to program of studies. I'll make a motion to approve the program of studies as amended. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Here we go. Four zero two. He would have been in trouble without that. Trouble. Well, <laughs> I would have asked Dr. Cochran tomorrow, did they approve that? <laughs> I would hate to upload it to the, the website. I'm getting a lot of calls about when's the new program of studies. You know, everybody's <coughs> getting anxious. So that's good. good go. Thank you. When do you expect to start student mm -hmm. registrations? Um, Wednesday, March 5th. And um, Lori said Lori said the 8th grade parent night was the 24th. It's actually the 4th. So it's the Tuesday that we come back from vacation. We'll have um, the counselors will be at LMS all day talking to the kids about course selection. And then that night we'll have the parents in as well. Expect work selection to, to close and be able to get section counts. Um, the last day to select is the 14th, Friday, the 14th of March, and then I have a meeting scheduled with the other administrators and counselors on Thursday, the 20th, to look at numbers and section needs and and teaching the staffing needs. So um, we should really have. Everything by 21st. Is that working out, Brian? I know. <laughs> it's unruly tonight. <laughs> to sign one of the programs. by the 20th would be great. Yep, that's exactly the 20th. I've already scheduled the, the meeting with everybody here, so I'll have all those to you by the end of the day on the 20th of March, which is a nicer timeline than what we had last year. <laughs> and that will allow us, in cases where we have some flexibility in staffing, through the staffing process, would bode well. So, great job. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What a chance we got here by 10. Well, we should have had Lori do some late savings like two hours. <laughs> <laughs> we had like two hours ago. Yeah. Um, committee reports. Budget committee's not here. Do you have any committee meet? Have they met since? Budget committee's no. not here. <laughs> That's right. It takes offense to that. <laughs> But, well, we did one meeting and John attended it, right? Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, they uh, we voted against our budget. budget. Yeah. We're going to switch to like 3 3. Four, 3 3. So it's not approved either. Right. Uh, and it has gone to ballot. To print. To print. To print. Right. Um, SIS, SIS committee. The committee met last Tuesday. Uh, orientation to the task. Um, we have our second meeting tomorrow after school, and uh, uh, we'll be finalizing. We worked from a, a rubric that was used uh, in Nashua, uh, oh, 2008, and made some modifications based on our set of criteria. 
and so tomorrow's uh, meeting is is about getting people's input and finalizing the that uh, rubric for decision making and also giving them some because some of the things have to do with learning management systems and sort of the bigger vision for technology we're going to give them a little bit of that piece so they have a flavor of, of, of that um, the vendor presentations for uh, Follett, Aspen, Power School, and Infinite Campus are scheduled for March uh, 4th, 11th, and 18th from 2 to 4. 2 to 3 o'clock will be the sort of back of house technical administration piece, and the more teacher related functionality is 3 to 4. That way, we don't bore teachers with stuff that isn't especially relevant to them. We're still looking for a board member to, uh, uh, or two to be able to uh, uh, attend uh, some of those vendor presentations. Um, the District Technology Committee has been put together. Its work is to come up with a new five-year technology plan. It's due by the end of June. We're hoping to have it ready for the board to look at the first meeting in June. Uh, the committee begins its work on Monday, March 3rd. Um, no overlap between the uh, with teachers on the overlap between sorry the uh, the two committees um, we're also anticipating for the SIS site visits to potential vendors we're hoping to go from three possible vendors down to two uh, as you know from last meeting uh, all three vendors have a significant number of schools in New Hampshire in a drivable area so uh, we're looking to take a team of folks to schools to talk to uh, to folks and, and check it out on the ground as opposed to a vendor presentation. Uh, recommendation on the SIA system would come in early April. Um, and when we come with that recommendation, we'll have uh, anticipated uh, costs uh, and we'll dovetail it with a bigger presentation of the technology vision. Uh, we do expect that the annual cost for the, the, the service, the quality of service will go up. We believe that all three vendors will actually come in at a lower cost than the existing system. So, Excellent. There will be some, uh, depending on the amount of functionality and what we add, and especially if we're, if we're building this to go to a high school system which has a student technology device so that we have another 500 technology devices on the go. There will be some back of house costs. So we'll have what we think are some pretty realistic estimates of what that would cost, at what point we would need it, and where, where the funding for that would come. Um, my assumption going forward is that we don't have a whole lot of money to throw at this, and that also means that we're going to try and bring forward a proposal that can be layered somewhat. Here's full benefit, full cost. Here are the in-between <coughs> options, depending on the boards and the and the uh, town's ability to fund. Uh, so we'll have as much as, as we can on that uh, by the end of March, I believe, was the charge from the board. So. Cool. Uh, business administration report. Uh, in the packet uh, is my first attempt to provide you with an executive financial summary, and I'll, I'll just take a few moments to, to walk you through it very briefly and answer any questions you might have. But th basically, this is part of my um, sometimes daily, uh, but certainly on a monthly basis, to look at um, where we are with the general fund and also with the food service fund. I'll just run through it just briefly on the under the general, general fund category. As you can see, it's just <coughs> gives you uh, an overview of the revenue budget. Uh, it also shows the, the fund balance because that is part of our uh, cash position to start the, the school year. So it shows total revenue, um, actual total revenue variance. So it looks at it from a, not only from a year-to-date uh, perspective. So in instance, for instance, you can see revenue. Uh, we have a budget of 19499 519, we've taken in a little over uh, 14 and a half million. Uh, so we still have tw approximately 25% of our revenue to come in. Uh, expenditures, uh, again, the budget for the expenditures, the appropriations, if you will, 
the actual um, in the variance. And this, for illustrative purposes, is a good time for me to kick it off because it helps understand this. We're about a midpoint, if you will, for the school year. So you want to see around that 45 to 48 percent range of, of uh, especially in the expenditures area. So we've spent down uh, approximately half of our appropriations. And then we have 8.3 million encumbered. So you can see below total expenditures and encumbrances, um, it leaves us with approximately $1.1 million today. If we were to be at the end of the fiscal year, we'd have approximately $1.1 million. Uh, but as you know, that's going to change and will change. It's a, it's a rolling report. Uh, I utilize this also to determine and make certain that we have adequate cash position for the, for the district. I call that cash balance position. That basically is just taking in actual cash received and actual cash paid out. So if you will, it's our checkbook balance approximately. And then the fund operating balance, you'll always see that to be a high negative at the start, the mid, and then it starts to wear itself down, obviously, as we spend down um, the encumbrances as well as um, bringing in a higher level of, of revenue. Uh, below the double line are some of the metrics that I take a look at each month and provide you with a report if you feel that this is this is worthwhile. Um, obviously, the biggest part of the district's uh, expenditures um, are in the salary and benefits, so obviously we want to take a look at that. And as you can see, year to date, we, uh, we've spent approximately 44% of our, uh, of our budgeted amount for salaries. And then if you take into consideration the encumbrances throughout the remainder of this year, we uh, right now we're projecting to overspend the salary line by around 40, 80, I'm sorry, $82,000 or eight tenths of 1%. And that's um, primarily responsible for the paraeducators that were brought into the, to the district that were not appropriated as part of the budget development process. Uh, benefits, as you can see, again, we've spent approximately 47% of the appropriation year to date. We have another 1.955 encumbered. Uh, right now, um, we're projecting a, a, an underspend of that appropriation of around $36,000. That's not much, uh, based in uh, the trend in comparison to previous years for the district. We, we're shrinking that. Uh, um, typically, we would have seen a higher projected balance, for, the, for especially in the benefits area, because of the guaranteed maximum <coughs> rate budget, and then the actual rates come in typically lower. Uh, other salaries. Um, Again, same process. You can see that we've spent approximately 43 percent. That would be stipends, um, substitutes, so on and so forth. And then you get a total salary and benefits. Um, year to date, we've spent 45 percent, which again is right at the midpoint where we want to be. If you add in the encumbrances um, for salaries and benefits, we are projecting right now to underspend that appropriation by approximately $40,000, uh, less than one half of one percent very low. Some of the other uh, metrics looking at are substitutes. Obviously, you want to keep a track on, on that. And you can see, again, we spent down 49% of that. Uh, we have some encumbrance there for a long-term long sub. Uh, it looks like um, we know that we will not have $50,000 underspent at the I end of the year. Say, yeah. That's You're assuming you don't need a sub for the rest of the no. year other than the ones you've already encumbered for. Oh, I'm not assuming. I, you didn't hear me say that. <laughs> no, that's what your number says. <laughs> that's what the numbers say. Numbers yeah. can be distorted because you don't. we don't encumber for daily subs. Yeah. Um, so basically what that is saying is you have $50,000 between now and the end of the school year for your daily subs. We know we that's have very some low. long-term subs of June regions coming up. Right. We have, I think, three commitments for long-term subs coming up. So we're monitoring that closely. So the first 100 days we spent 93,000. The last 80 we have to spend 50,000. Is what you're saying? That's going to be a problem. <laughs> we've already discussed with the administrators. Um, and we've we've had it in one of our administrative meetings as a topic of discussion. That that's going to need to be closely monitored, especially as we get close to the end of the school year, when the frequency of hiring daily subs seems to pick up for districts. Are um, any of those long-term subs going to positively impact the salary line? No. A sub, we have a teacher salary that's well. No, we'll have one uh, if long it's a long term, term leave for uh, we will have a, a hiring tonight 
that won't have much impact, but, but there will be some savings for the situation we're going to talk tonight. But the other situations are all teacher salary, and the long term set will be on top of that. Uh, one of the other metrics, obviously, we look at is utilities. Uh, that would include your oil, propane, uh, telephone, uh, electricity, all the utilities uh, bundled into one. And as you can see, again, uh, we're projecting uh, potentially an underspend there of 24,600. But as you, uh, 24, but as you've heard, we're going to be making an adjustment to the encumbrance line uh, for the oil uh, increase, rate increase. Um, for uh, purchasing um, from another uh, provider for the remainder of the year. Uh, we look at buildings and grounds as well, and, and there's some concern there as well, even though, it, again, it shows the uh, unencumbered funds around 151, that a good portion of that will be encumbered between now and the end of the year, and transportation as well. I'm glad we're not paying by the inch for snow removal this year. Or per <laughs> storm. Yeah. Or per day. <laughs> Uh, or per ton of salt. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, the analysis for food service is, is similar until you get down to the bottom utilities because that we don't prorate uh, on the general fund over to the food service fund. So uh, it will stop right at the uh, substitutes. So if this is helpful, this is something that I do on a monthly basis. It kind of provides you with an, an overview, if you will, a summary of where we're at. Um, and it, it also help out, I think, as we get closer to the end of the fiscal year, it will start bringing in the picture of projected unassigned fund balance for the uh, for the fiscal year. Right? I think it's a good snapshot. It helps me for sure. So, Frank, thumbnail sketch significantly tighter than last year? Yes. Primarily in the health, in the salary and benefit area. Mm -hmm. Very tight in that because, again, we absorbed some positions there that were um, not anticipated during budget development. A little concerned about utilities and what we do there over the next few months and uh, if it stops snowing and gets uh, and get a little warmer it will help is there any hope of any cost recovery from the well, I was just going to ask if you could update us on that sure and um, I think the latest news is actually from today <laughs> yeah but uh, the, the, the latest is we have terminated the contract with um, full of oil uh, due to non-performance. Um, we held out hope, uh, however it didn't uh, come to fruition that uh, we had ordered a substantial amount of oil and didn't receive the deliveries as promised. Um, so we had no other course but to terminate the contract, um, which we've done. And we are we just made a major purchase with Burke who, who has made a, a soft commitment to provide us Soft being that there's no contractual obligation, but they will they will fulfill the needs of the district for the remainder of this fiscal year without a, without a contract. Uh, they, they're giving us their their uh, kind of a fixed rate price. It's a, it's approximately 20 cents more per gallon, um, so it's it is a little bit pricey. But again, it's it's we're receiving deliveries as promised. Uh, two days we'll call up and we get them two days. They're delivering with the proper vehicle, which is a gravity feed. Uh, we are actually getting a slip uh, at delivered at the time of uh, to the school at the time of delivery, so we can then go out and and uh, stick, if you will, the tanks and make sure that the amount that is on the slip is actually in the tank, which we were unable to do before. So there's been a lot of uh, well, it's been a lot of downside for this process, but a lot of upside as well. And Burke uh, Burke is to be commended for their ability to to really meet the needs. We did receive some correspondence. It was a uh, uh, a mailing from Fuller that said if you have sustained some um, uh, financial loss, you can place a claim with them. Um, but uh, I guess to answer the roundabout, whatever, getting into detail, the, the opportunity for us to, to recover is probably very low at this point. How many more gallons are required, Frank, at the higher rate? Uh, we just got uh, almost nine, 9,500 gallons between the two schools, and uh, at a burn rate, if, if we're looking at 150 gallons a day, um, I think we're, we're looking probably at another, maybe another, we can get away with another 10,000 for, for the two schools. Um, so far, Frank, it's cost us 
with the, the Phillips that we'd not received when we were down and we filled up with uh, the other company. Um, so going forward, 10,000 more than it's cost us already, is that what you're saying? No, 10,000 gallons. Okay. No. Um, it, it's a, it's probably cost about $2,500 so to Phillips between what we would have spent. If we extrapolate that to the end of the year, best guess? 5000 6000 maybe. Yeah. Somewhere with five, six thousand dollars Five, seven thousand. We'll, when we'll readjust that once we get a, a handle um, on what the fixed price is from Burke. We'll we'll uh, we'll modify the encumbrance. In fact, we were working on that today, releasing the encumbrance that we had, and based on the original contract with Fuller, we'll we'll now re recalculate that encumbrance and put that into the system, so you'll see that next month. Food service, what is that? Food service is, uh, as I brought to the board before, um, we have had an ongoing issue with the point of service um, software and hardware that is currently in place in the food service program, and I won't go through the entire memorandum, but um, we've had, unfortunately, three occurrences where the software did not function as it, as it should, uh, primarily and more specifically end of end of day processing where it's to upload um, to the actual the, the database uh, by um, upload to the database of meal time uh, we actually lost a lot of that information um, so much that we could only recreate a portion of it and by um, Hilda's estimate we lost approximately uh, $1,400 in reimbursements on the free and reduced lunch program because we just weren't able to to um, bring that data back into the system. Uh, hardware is is a problem as well. Um, it's not uncommon to see um, the food service cafeteria work is writing down on a piece of paper student charges and then have to go in at the end of the day and, and find a computer and find a system that's working to upload it into the mealtime program. The hardware that it we're using with mealtime is proprietary, so it's not easily replaced. Uh, we've been <coughs> cannibalizing it a little bit. Um, they actually have frayed. Uh, when I was in there the other day, I was looking at some of the uh, electrical cords in there. They're frayed. And they're a little bit of a <coughs> safety concern as well. So I got together with Hilda and, and Kyle when we looked at meal time and, and what uh, could be done to fix the current problems and, 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 uh, and only the way that Kyle can understand. But bottom line is meal time was unable to provide the te technical support for us to fix the problem of uploading on a, on a nightly basis to the database. Uh, right now we're, we're simply doing everything locally at, the, at the, each of the three schools. Uh, meal time recommended that maybe we should buy our own server and start downloading the information on a nightly basis to our own server, uh, obviously at our cost. So uh, Hilda and Kyle went out and reviewed other food service software, uh, point of sale program software and hardware, and they did come back with a recommendation um, on a company um, that they feel uh, can service what our, our needs are today as well as going forward and some add-ons that we would look at in, in subsequent uh, time. But they're recommending uh, NutriKids, if you've ever heard of it. They, uh, their parent company is Heartland School Solutions. Um, they have 20, over 2,200 accounts nationwide. <coughs> they have 400 school I'm sorry, 40 school districts here in New Hampshire. <coughs> um, cost? Uh, let me just quickly, implementation, we were hoping that we would be able to get through this school year. It doesn't appear that that's going to be the case. We're really uh, holding our breath, if you will, on, on not having another hiccup with the, with the software. Um, so the proposal that uh, is, is on the table for consideration from um, Hotland is um, a one-time cost of, of $14,670. Um, and as you can see, that would include the uh, point of sale manager enterprise, the free and reduced uh, component of it as well, uh, cafeteria license and the station license, optical scanner and on-site training. They would actually be here for three days um, to work with us to, to um, run a parallel system to make sure 
all the information comes over correctly to the new, to the new software. Uh, hardware costs, we're projecting a, uh, a $10,000 cost. It would be no greater than $10,000. We might be able to reduce the size of the, the screens, which will be a little bit of a cost savings. Um, the annual license fee for this particular program is $1,175. That includes an extended warranty as well. <coughs> and Frank and Kyle have already done their homework. The vendor is SIF compliant, which would mean that would any of the three vendors that we choose for the student information system, this would be compatible with. That's right. This comes out of the food service budget fund yes. anyway, right? So, on the second so page is no general fund. The, the fund analysis. Um, okay. Get some choices. Right now, I did work with Hilda a little bit, and we worked through the <coughs> revenue and expenditures, and we also took a look at uh, a forecast of if this, if the six-month or the, the uh, five five-month operation uh, trends out through the end of the year, <coughs> we're looking to have positive balance in food service of around fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah, first time in about six years. Yeah. <coughs> um, that's again if all the trends continue the way they're going. The fund balance for food service right now ending uh, June 30th, 2013 is 70852 So if the forecast of 15705 holds true to the end of the year, you add that to the fund balance, we would have a fund balance in food service of approximately $86,000. The, uh, the the Nutri Kids proposal, if we were to take that, um, I guess the upside, there's two pieces to that. We will be underspending by approximately $85,000 the approved appropriation for food service. I guess, Hilder, and if you look at past years, it's, it's very uncommon that we spend the, the full appropriated um, budget for food service. So there is room for us to absorb the 24670 of the Nutri Kids proposal and not exceed the approved appropriation for food service for this current year. The question is, how do we pay for it? And, and there's a couple of scenarios here, but um, as you can see by, and I won't go into all of it, but for the most part, we will need to um, utilize some of the unreserved fund balance at the end of the year because, again, while we will underspend the appropriations, the revenues Will, will not support the $24,000. So we, we would use some portion of the unassigned fund balance to fund this. Um, how much of it? Again, if the $15,000 holds true, as you can see at the bottom, uh, fund balance contribution for 2014 in the first block would be around $9,000. So we would effectively lower the fund balance by approximately $9,000. As you can see, I, I just put in a couple of other scenarios, 50, 50, if we funded 50% through budget, um, or, or if, if our projection of having a positive balance at the end of the year, we actually had, we'll say $1,000 or, or consider, uh, marginally a zero contribution from the budget, we would need to, to utilize the fund balance to, to, to uh, pay for, if you will, the multi-kids. Um, the budget impact on the, um, Potentially on the equipment, we, we do have some availability of funds in our equipment lines for all three locations. Uh, approximately half of what we would need to spend, we could use that. Uh, however, I'm a little concerned that if any, if we use the full amount of the available, available funds, we'll, we could run into a problem. We still have five months to go for the school year. And the budget impact on the annual annualized lease, uh, we'd actually be saving $116 a year on the on the license for multi kids. The other uh, option is to do nothing uh, and wait and, and do this over the summer. See where we're at with the um, uh, next year, where we could find uh, funding opportunities. But I, I don't believe that there'll be. Um, any more available next year than they are this year. I think that's really an option, doing nothing. Well, the only thing is Hilda's saying that we've potentially lost yeah. money by not right. having this up and running properly. We lost the, the data. I mean, it, it um, something happened. It w wasn't on our end. It was that upload end of night processing. Um, and it... Um, 
disappeared for, for non-technical explanation. And, uh, and and we don't know if and when <coughs> those events will happen again. Right. I guess my, my preference would just be to use the, the fund balance inside of the food service fund to pay for it. Is that the most logical thing to do? It, it is. In this case, I think um, if and we'll, we'll lower the amount that we'll need to draw on the, un, the unassigned fund balance by the positive operation of this year. So in other words, the maximum drawdown of the fund balance will be the 24670 And that will be lessened by whatever we turn out to have operational balance at the end of this year. I try not to say profit because we don't have profits. And you need to Frank, do we not, um, we're not going to save any money by dropping meal time or it's all the money's already been put up front? It's already been, it's a contractual, we can try and we will try, we have, we review the contract and if we do, um, we will terminate the contract with cause based on their uh, inability to perform by the contract and we'll ask them to prorate. So we could, we could bring back some money there, but you might be looking at four or five hundred dollars. Yeah. Do you need a motion from us to approve purchasing this? Um, I, yes. Um, the, the only thing about using the entire balance is uh, I know at one point the state was recommending you have three months yeah. worth of revenue as your fund balance for food service because if you have to do some out of budget cycle equipment, Placement. Power outage and lose several thousand dollars worth of dairy products. That's never happened here. <laughs> oh, I saw. I think we've gotten out. good oh, yes, at it. it. I think we've gotten better at it. So I, um, I think I think our our maintenance people do a fabulous job of knowing. It's not the big freezers. The big freezers can go for several days. It's the smaller freezers. It's the dairy yes. products here. The smaller Just freezers. Set them outside. Couldn't, couldn't we just set them outside? <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So at the end of the year, so say we spend the twenty-four thousand dollars and we put it against this year's food service fund. Right. Food service fund is going to end up having a negative balance of probably around ten thousand dollars if all projections go down. Right. Can we take and rather than drawing down the fund, we no, can it's transfer positive money fifteen thousand this year. Well, it's positive plus fifteen unless we spend twenty-four thousand oh. on this. Then it'll be a negative ton ten. We could Which transfer one? ten thousand over from general fund to cover the negative and not draw down. Our current fund balance of seventy thousand. Couldn't we? You potentially could, if you, yeah. if we had it budgeted. Um, typically, what happens is if you're putting a budget together for food service with a deficit, potential deficit balance at the end of the year, you will actually budget that amount oh, over right. in your general fund to make that transfer to food service. To subsidize, if you will, the deficit. So can we not do that because yeah, it's not there right now? Well, uh, that, that's really a question, probably for the the, uh, the auditors on that, because right. you do have a positive fund balance in food service, um, yeah. and even if you held and, and everybody tries to hold to the standard that you have in your unreserved fund balance, three month carry for operation of your food service program. I don't know too many school districts that would have that. We certainly don't have it. On a, if you're looking at it from a even if you spread it out over a 12-month period, we're still not there, even with current balance today. Um, that's, you, you really look at maybe two months. Um, so, uh, again, uh, Hilda has done a great job so far this year to, to really, um, you know, enhance, we're really looking at ways for her to enhance revenues there and keep a, keep a close watch on um, expenditures as well. So. Um, yeah, and that, that 24 uh, will be offset uh, by the operating revenue. And I can get that answered to regarding the transfer. It's, it's been done before um, in other districts, which remain nameless at this point, but we used to transfer it over because, again, as you know, the transfer is required because the food service can't get a deficit position yeah. at the end of the fiscal year. Right. Quite honestly, given the size of the food service operation and the expense of equipment breakage we should be we should have well 
probably what we had four or five years ago in the range of eighty to one hundred thousand dollars in right. well, surplus. I mean, Frank, is that based on your experience? Would that be a reasonable number? Yes. It, it's interesting because again, there's the. the Hilda and her staff do a great job. They literally were there one day. I, I try to make a daily trek into the cafeteria during lunches, and it's it's not uncommon. They're running around plugging in a printer or plugging in the keyboard, uh, the, the pad that the students and staff enter their uh, ID codes to charge their. So it's they really have maximized. I, I, I believe this is the same hardware they've had since they opened up the school and the software program. So it's. Uh, they've gotten their money's worth for sure. We actually bought this probably six years ago. We did a, um, <coughs> we overspent the appropriation. We went to the budget committee and got the approval to overspend the appropriation to put this system in because we didn't have anything. It was, you know, cash or check. <laughs> and you know what it's like sending, you know, well, first graders, you paid for the month. You kind of had to pick the days you were going to do it. But um, there's is there any E-rate money or anything like that we could <clears throat> that's left that we could potentially tap into to pay for some of the hardware that might save us a couple of thousand? That's pretty much taken up. Well, no, it's more than taken up. It's more than with taken the cost up. for the student information system. I'd say use the capital reserve, but there's about five hundred and thirty-three dollars there. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't even pay for the software. I mean, Hilder has even sold off, as you recall, some equipment that wasn't being used. <clears throat> so she really is, is, they're doing a great job, she and her staff, to, to hopefully turn this around where we have a positive balance. And we're, as you can see, we're projecting it this year. I, I, I think they would be. Um, can we approve the purchase now, and then you can come back with a recommendation on how to fund it afterwards, or do we have to approve the? Sure. It's a, it's a eight week uh, lead time to by the time. Oh, so we got plenty of time. Okay. Yeah. We'll have a much better we budget like picture in eight the, weeks too. Uh, we would. Yeah. We'd like to get the. Um, get on the list, basically. Get get online with scheduling from the uh, standpoint of the new company. Um, Again, they have to schedule. Uh, we're looking at April vacation potentially okay. as an implementation. Uh, bring the staff in. We've already kind of worked on a tentative timeline, um, and we'll run parallel systems to make sure all the student balances, all the staff balances, on the f on the uh, student accounts, staff accounts come over properly. So we've got time from that standpoint. We'd just like to go forward. Just want the stamp so you can actually schedule it. Yes. Okay. Yep. So we'll make a motion to. Well, can I just well. Can I just ask a question? Uh, the NutriKids program, what was it about that that you guys decided that that was the one that would work best for us? Uh, I, I wasn't, I didn't you weren't part get of involved the, with that, oh, okay. but I know Kyle and um, Hilda went out and actually looked at a couple of programs. Hilda spoke with other food service directors. Um, and as you can see, 40 school districts are utilizing this program. I think not only was the initial program to step off with it as far as doing the food service program that you can actually do menu preparation and nutritional analysis as part of the, one of the components that you can add on uh, online payments for parents or staff if you want to make a payment into the your, your account that's an add-on as well which, which the program doesn't have right now and the functionality of it and the and the, the ability to to really make it user friendly was was a big plus as well i think it was Bo. i think they went to Bo to look at one of the schools Locally, they, they went to look at all the food service directors could sort very highly of the program. So, if um, she has the food menu plans through this and the nutrition plans, are these both reports that they have to send up to the state, or what? What is it? It part of that's the requirement under the new school okay. guidelines. Yep, you have to right. look at uh, nutritional analysis of the, of the of the meals that you're putting out, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the report, reporting, and then, and then also one of the big areas that would be very helpful right now is we actually take the information from the student information system and do a manual input into the food service software of, of students that are uh, eligible for free and reduced lunch. That's a manual process right now. This new system will have the capability to actually do a uh, 
do an interface. If you will. There's a lot of pluses. And, and again, I didn't want to make it sound like we're looking at it because there, there, there's more capability. We're looking at it because, it, again, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a baseline program that will meet our, meet our needs. Not well, only today, but I think it has some growth. That's potential. why I asked that question. Yep. You know, I don't, I don't want to be buying bells and whistles that we just don't nope. need. No. Nope. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the NutriKids point of sale purchase. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? State? Motion carries 400. Thank you. And the only other uh, agenda item is actually um, we will be coming back March 5th with the PPACA update. Okay. Excellent. Uh, technology reports there for your review. So, um, just a question. The people that get the uh, virtual desktops rolled out, how do they burn CDs? You ask me an IT question? <laughs> Aren't you in charge of IT? No. Doesn't the IT director report to you? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I used to look this way. I was like, come how on. Does, how does somebody that gets the virtual desktop burn something to a CD? You don't. How do you don't? <laughs> well, isn't that a loss of capability for the individuals? And I also understand at the high school there's limited resolutions available. Doesn't limited resolutions available. In terms of? Like 1024 by 768 is the best resolution you oh, can really? do versus what you used to be able to do on your PC. We're talking about the, the workstations or? Mm, well, the people that got their desktops that Kyle noted replaced with the, the virtual systems. And I'm assuming it's an issue at... When did they get it? When or where? <coughs> oh, a couple of weeks ago. Because it does take... We had some issues like that as, as well. Because what you have to do is you have to understand what's the version of the software and you have to go in and do some, some uh, maximizing of the system. So what is the, the server... The resolution, it's usually something like that is a compatibility issue. What are the settings that they have in the server versus the machine? And, and so I know that at the uh, GMS, when they went through the, uh, uh, no, sorry, LMS, when they did that, they had to go in and do some, some tweaking. Probably took the better part of a month to, to make that sort of piece. But it shouldn't decrease, although it, it, it may mess with some of the settings. This was described to me as a downgrade. Yeah, it shouldn't be. And the explanation was that there's not enough memory on the server to support high resolutions. That's strange. I don't know. I just said I would ask. <laughs> Kyle conveniently put it in his technology report to remind me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a donation from the Knights of Columbus. Yeah. Can we get a motion to accept that? I don't have it. Oh, okay. $295 to be. Uh, yeah, it's directed towards special ed at GMS. I'll make a motion. Accept. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Closing All that through Tootsie Rolls. Yeah, that's lots of Tootsie Rolls. That's a lot of Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> 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 Clearly, the dental industry is thriving in the area <laughs> if we're selling that many, many Tootsie Rolls. Manifest? No, public input? Do we have snappy? Snappy. He said next. No, on the fifth. Jason Gerard, 11 Perry Court. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's, uh, I'd like to say sitting, sitting in the audience and, and at home and, and paying attention to what goes on here, um, I, I can tell you that the level of comfort felt because Frank is over there is, is, is incredible. Um, again tonight, I, I can't tell you how many times that I've asked for this type of forecast to be done. I even made a motion once to have this kind of thing done and it was not even seconded. Um, so Frank putting this out gives a great snapshot of exactly where we are and what we can expect through the year. Um, this kind of tool is, is what we do in the business world every day. Got to have the numbers. So Frank, that's just fantastic. Um, priority school. Um, I'm glad we're off the list, I guess, but it doesn't really change who we are. I mean, it just simply says we're not on a list that the government says we were on because we don't 
so I, I don't see what the big deal was. Um, but I, I guess to some people it, it means a lot. Um, and I guess we're happy that we're not doing the kneecaps anymore. I've had my own um, concerns with kneecap and, and what it really says. Uh, unfortunately, we've jumped out of the frying pan into the fire with, with the uh, smarter balance. Um, I would highly suggest that members of this board speak to the principal out in Nashua who has piloted this. Um, there's a lot of other things across the country, but you know that's local. Um, it, what I'm seeing and hearing is it's more of a challenge for, um, you know, it's kind of been discussed here about what kids know on a computer versus what they can express on a test. Um, a lot of the feedback that I've been seeing and, and uh, there, was a, there was a hearing in Concord today, as a matter of fact, with, with, with the whole Common Core thing and whatnot, but a lot of this information came out by a lot of very respected people today up in Concord talking about how, again, this is an exercise not in measuring content, but how well a kid can use a computer. Um, unfortunately, a kid is, you know, some, some kids are better than others. I got one that's way better than the other. Um, and it's just because they do different things, right? So I'm not sure, and, and again, it might be worked out in the long term, um, but again, a lot of very smart people are, are, are very, very, very concerned, um, and that causes me concern. And I, I hope it does to the board members here, um, because again, we're rolling, you know, these trains are rolling, we're not gonna stop it, but all we can do is, is make sure we're on the right track. Um, and lastly, um, I hope the new the, the, the new lunch thing you bought can take a payment in more than two to five days, because in our district it takes two to five days if you make a credit card payment to, to hit your kid's account, and um, I'm told sometimes kids get turned away or eat a lesser meal because their accounts may be close or 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 over. I know I know I get busy sometimes and I'll get an email or something that says hey you know you got a low balance notification and. By the time I put my credit card in there and it takes several days, you know, we wouldn't want something like what happened in Utah happening here, you know, where we turn kids away just because, you know, we're busy, you know, we're busy in our lives. Anyway, uh, have a good night. And with that, can I get a motion to enter non public session under RSA 918 a the dismissal, promotion, or compensation of any public employee or the disciplining of such employee or the investigation of any charge against them unless the employee affected one has a right to a meeting and two requests the meeting be open, in which case regrets shall be granted. B, the hiring of any person as a public employee. C, matters which, if discussed in public, would likely affect adversely the reputation of any person other than a member or the body or agency itself. So Did you practice reading <laughs> that fast? I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's like a, been a while. Uh, yes. Yes, 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 and, and yeah, and that. Uh,